Hello? Hello? I'm putting out links now. Give me just a sec. Cool, cool. Hooray for audio mishaps. How is everybody doing today? I am your humble host, Gavin the Kitty, and today I am doing an art stream. We're going to be drawing, doodling, and doing all sorts of things. And speaking of doodling, today with me is the lovely... Hello, I am Argent Dino of Doodle Owl. Um, I make fursuits, do all sorts of other crafts, and more. He is very good at what he does. In fact, he is currently... Uh the person I could we commissioned for Karmic's version three. So yeah. Um I am super excited and honored to be working on him. Um I'm absolutely terrified of this particular commission in the best possible way. It's gonna be a wonderful challenge. <laughs> yes. Uh uh the two go ahead. Oh, I was saying the two big things I'm going to be working on with you is just trying to figure out how to appropriately mount glasses and also add in appropriate fan mounts. Never done this much electronics before. Going to be a really good time. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, uh, and we have a... We have the great Oxide with us as well. And what if we were to... But, you see, if you really want to attach fan mounts, the best way I've learned is through copious amounts of duct tape and ensure there's plastic between the fan and the CPU. It gives it extra cooling strength, you see. That's ah. that's great, but we're talking fursuits, bud. <laughs> the same thing still applies. <laughs> uh, I'll be sure to absolutely use huge amounts of thermal paste on the fursuit, too. The more, the better. I, exactly. You know, you know what's better than thermal paste? Just use hot glue. It does the same thing. How are you guys doing today, overall? <laughs> Me? Overall, pretty good, I think. Question mark? Life's been very odd recently. Uh, anything before a convention's always a lot of stress and burnout as I scream into a void trying to get everything done. Uh, how about you, Oxide? Uh, good. I've, I'm finally not completely busy and totally stressed out anymore. I finally finished my thesis, submitted it, successfully defended it, and I am now done with my master's degree. So I am no longer constantly in a state of work, then thesis work, then sleep, then repeat, essentially. You know, five days, of, well, seven days a week, actually. So L Lovely. Uh, all right, well, how about we, how, how is the chat doing? How, how are the viewers doing? Uh, and I'm doing all right overall. I'm existing. I'm doing some doodles with with some peeps. Um, how about doodle? How about we jump into one of the first topics of conversation? Because this is supposed to be this is the opener for a two part video. 
essentially preface, uh, prefacing before we get to that video, which it's over something that hasn't happened yet, so we're just kind of preparing. Uh, so Doodle How, where are you going this weekend? I'm going to Denver. It's my local convention. I'm terrified. I wish I wasn't terrified. It's unfortunate, and I want to have a good time, and I think it's going to be an excellent time because the community is very well done, but I want to feel better about how the convention is running itself, and I don't currently. Uh, which is why he reached out to me, uh, saying, hey, you have a platform, how about we do a video on Denver and how to strengthen the community better? which is what will probably end up happening next week. We're hoping it goes well this weekend, but um, cautiously optimistic. I'm not even going to be at the convention. Um, I'm just going to be the guy reporting the news this time around. Lending a much-needed um, expertise in video editing because I very clearly do not know what I'm doing, and I will freely state that ahead of time. Uh, um, I don't want to use this to be an opportunity to bash on Denver. A lot of people, including myself, have already done that in appropriate channels. I more want this to have a conversation about, like, what do we want out of our conventions, what I'm not currently comfortable with. And I also want to point out before we even get to anything that, like, hey, Denver might be a great time. This could be a be great big nothing burger. The best case scenario is that I show up and there's nothing to report on but a bunch of cute suitors and some really awesome panels. Of course, we'll still make the video because we want to strengthen the community in that area, but still. Exactly, exactly. Um, the big thing that's just seemed kind of odd about it to me is the lack of responsiveness. It's... I'm not sure if we are, if anybody here is familiar with the kind of backstory with Corgi events and how we got to Denver this year. So, long story short is RMFC shut down due to some hilarious involving tax scandals. That's how Boozy Badger entered the fandom. It was actually a pretty okay trade in my mind. He's awesome. Um, you can read all about it on his website if you really want to. But after that, the local community decided that, hey, there was a really solid idea, and the idea that behind Corgi Events as a company was, you know, all of the stuff to run a convention, you can pack all of that into a van. Why do all of these different conventions have all of their own, like, AV equipment, and, like, line dividers, and big speakers, and stage equipment, and all of this other stuff? Which sounds so like a great idea on paper to keep it all in one place and just ship it all over the place. Yeah, and so this isn't just a story of Denver, it's also Painted Desert for a Con, um, Sin City Murcon to some, except, to some extent, as well as Golden State for a Con, and Aquatifer and others. It isn't just Denver, which is also why I'm like a little bit nervous about things going forward with this organization and the community, because it won't be localized to just Colorado. Oh, also, Oxide, uh, I know that you... Are, uh, you are local to the BRFF uh, North Carolina area. Uh, these are problems that don't necessarily happen on this side of things because we have mm -hmm. very strong community leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, right, but, yeah. Uh, we have stuff like, we have Kage, we've got Alkali, we've got everybody on this side of the thing, of the fence. Uh, California's got their own stuff. But then there's this great big chunk of the middle of the of North America where they don't have as many strong people to run these events or host them. Or if there are strong people, they're not working on those conventions. They're working on other conventions. So Well, yeah, and I mean, in my head, and not to really get too sidetracked, just, to, just in my head, it kind of almost makes sense just from a purely mathematical standpoint of the vision i mean because if you think about it the you know flyover states in the united states have uh the population density is much is significantly lower whereas most of your population is concentrated on the western side with either california or washington and on the eastern seaboard it's new york virginia um maryland and uh Georgia and so you can anticipate that just by assuming an, a, 
certain percentage of the population in any given region is going to be furries, we're going to have a lot fewer of them in the Midwest. And because of that, I would anticipate that you have a lower chance of having those particularly strong leaders. So mathematically, it makes sense, but it is still... It still sucks. Yeah. I'm... The odd thing about the Colorado fandom is that, yes, on paper, I would agree with you. But we had an extremely strong meat apparatus back around between 2014-2016. There was mm -hmm. something going on every week. There still is something going on every week. There's a very odd density of stuff here, despite the lack of population. And even then, I mean, Denver isn't a small city. I mean, I think last I checked, the metro area itself was 3 million plus, you know, everything beyond Denver. But you are not wrong in terms of you sh there will be more of that on both of the coasts. The, mm -hmm. Which is exactly why I think Corgi events in of itself made sense on paper to begin with. Is a, hey, if we pool our resources in the middle of the country and have all of these other things, we can absolutely have more of these cons. I mean, with the exception being both Golden State Furcon and Sin City Mercon were on the West Coast proper. But again, the to be fair, the California fandom is fairly opaque to me, and I would love to hear from uh, members of that proper as to their structure. That particular meat apparatus did get shut down due to other drama result re um, related to the shutdown of RMFC back in 2016. It just became unsafe to host things the way we were, which to be fair was pretty damn dumb. A series of house parties is not a good way to have public invites people to and expect things to turn out okay. Which is another question I was curious about is how do you have a good public invite structure where you can get new people in to meets and new people doing things and have that community backbone without mm -hmm. having uh, continual problem people, drama, and otherwise harassers enter into that space. So, shifting away just a bit, that's what we're all going to be talking about probably sometime next week. This is just the introduction video, gets you guys to understand who Argent Lizard is, because since I don't live over on that side of things, I'm just the talking, I'm just the talking bit. I'm just like a news anchor, I'm not, not nothing more, nothing less in terms of all of that situation. But today, we're doing some lovely artwork, so, yeah. Um, going on that for just a little bit, and also changing the music, because for some reason I'm getting to the tracks that just sound like wheezing, and I'm sad. Uh, <laughs> there we go. But those are like the best tracks. I, you know, I'm the, look, I, I, I'm the kind of person that my favorite thing to listen to when I go running is the sound of distant, angry zombies chasing after if you want a motivation to go run it's that constant noise in your ear of just any second now you can become the undead or are you know angry crowds and freak and all that kind of stuff it's just it's it's great great music i'm actually completely kidding although that would be a really good app i thought like that's i listened to nirvana because i thought that's what it was the zombies you know God, you're not wrong. Uh, but no, actually, seriously though, that would actually be a really good motivational app. It just plays zombie noises and makes you run. You know what? Hmm. I, mean, I think like, they anyway. made one of those years and years back where like you could check how fast you were running from the zombies and if you managed to survive during your exercise today in terms of pace. That would actually... Huh. I, I want to look into that because that would actually be kind of awesome if also it's sort of terrifying and i'm really into zombies so like and i i hate it because i miss gavin's uh streams for um for resident evil and i'm so I'm upset not, that i wasn't able to get on them we're not done with resident evil okay good because i uh, was i've been looking for somebody else to help me cover resident evil zero because that game we have found very little to talk about and i'm struggling with how to play <laughs> Well, hey, there we go. I'm now free and not and not constantly staring at a screen, questioning my life decisions about why am I here? I mean, why did I agree to write a thesis over the summer and turn it in? Oh, well. 
Oh. You're just speedrunning college. You'll just have to. It'll be fine. No, but like legit though, I didn't start my thesis till May of this year, and I had to turn it in in July because. So that was uh. It, yeah, that was fun. Question mark. Procrastination. Uh, also, hello to everybody in chat. Uh, Foxano, Artie. Uh, our Artie says for us upstate, we have meets, uh, meet chats, and that's how we plan events and get a feel for who's local and also safe. Lol. Well, also, howdy, stopping in for five minutes before he had, she heads home. Uh, and then you said hi, stop, thanks for stopping in. If somebody could keep an eye on the chat and kind of that. Yeah, I'll keep it up. I can't. I, mean, I I just can't see the chat when I'm drawing because it's on another window and I, I take up the entire screen with my my art program. Totally fair. Um. But yeah. I but, ought to... no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, on topic of like Resident Evil style games, I had a friend recently send me a video about something called Dino Crisis, which of course I'm biased towards. Uh, Dino Crisis is freaking awesome. It was made by Capcom, and then they fucked up the third game on the Xbox and stopped making Dino Crisis games. And then they said, hey, you remember Dino Crisis? Yeah, we're making Exo Primal. Um, so, I don't know if you've seen... Oh, person. I don't know if you've seen it. a new one. Yeah, it's called Exo Primal. It's basically Dino Crisis, but multiplayer. And one of the things is, is that it's got a, uh... There's a moment in the game where it says, Releasing the Raptors. Yes. Just yes. It's Everything about this is the terror I've always you, wanted. You fight raptors in giant mech suits, and it's amazing. That is... Huh. That comes that out later this... That comes out later this year, and the multiplayer is really fun. I got to try it on PS5 when they did the little uh, demo. So... Oh, this by the way, Fever says a woo. So hello, Fever, F E V I R E. Fevery. Fevery. Okay, I wasn't sure how to pronounce that, but yes, there they say a woo, to which obviously uh, I say a woo back. Clearly, a mm. As a dinosaur, I don't know if I should go o wo or ovo. No, you should go roro. Roro. Uh, use yeah, we'll use wise instead, and it'll it'll make no sense because nobody will know how to say it. A reverse it stomp on me, senpai. I don't know. Well, I mean, the it's problem I have is <laughs> doesn't translate to any kind of text. So your mic uh, didn't yeah. e your mic didn't even pick that up. <laughs> Damn it! It doesn't work half the time. I mean, le there's a certain, like, level of, like, growly noises I can make in the back of my throat that started as voice training exercises to make my voice deeper that work really well as dinosaur noises when I'm in suit, but they literally don't work half the time out of suit, and it was only last year after making these for four years I didn't realize that people didn't click up the clicking noises that I was making. It was only me. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> so, so Arjun Lizard, just to confirm, you are, in fact, a scaly, correct? Um, well, I mean, I'm a dinosaur, which means I am specifically, the my species is inaccurate Microraptor Gooey. Um, we were one of the first species to have, like, really solid gliding abilities, and we put feathers on our back legs. So you are a flying scaly? Basic, yes. We, we are the existential crisis and, and or I don't know what I am that dinosaurs are. Got you. So, seeing as you are, in fact, a member of the lizard, of uh, the scaly, of the larger scaly group, which includes things such as lizards, can you, are you able to confirm if Mark Zuckerberg is in fact a lizard person? Well, I mean, we do control everything, so we have to start there. Um, the big problem okay. is Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> had his lizard privileges revoked and continues to try to control mm -hmm. the world, and that's why everything's going to shit. When we actually ran everything, it's fine. But, like, there was this asteroid 65 million years ago, and that's when, uh -huh. like, certain other groups, like the Illuminati, started making themselves known, and I haven't really been mm -hmm. able to work against them since. 
Well, according to Rick and Morty, it's squirrels that control most things now, and that's what I've been hearing a lot through my my channels. You know, everybody knows birds aren't real. The squirrels are. Uh, okay, so they're just in they're in robotic flight suits, is what you're saying, pretending to be birds. Yes, the the the, the, the birds are not cameras. They are in fact uh -huh. squirrels. And the squirrels are in flight suits pretending to be birds, and they are in fact, there is no mind control involved in 5G, but it does help them upload this extra amount of information they are recording completely manual with like, hand crank recorders like it's the 1920s. Okay, so can't it's anything it, digital. It basically, the, so basically like the flying squirrel guys, the sugar cane glider ones, I, they just didn't get the memo, right? I, I don't know, I don't know hippies. what the hell is going on in... Right now, I, I, what? Uh, we're talking, well, we're talking about, obviously, no, 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 the fact I know what you're talking about. I'm just confused <laughs> how we got there. What? He asked me directly what the lizard person conspiracy was, and I'm always honest about it, and no one ever believes me, and it's the perfect I cover. See, exactly. See, the thing is, what you've done effectively is you've invited two people with equally, equally, um, I guess, I don't want to say jaded, but equally uh, topsy-turvy minds, yes, and now we're able to create this web and spire of, we're exploring the web and spire of uh, conspiratorial um, creatures that control the world that aren't actually human. Listen, I'm not even going to argue it, I'm just going to say uh, this was one thing that I was supposed to, that I didn't think I'd have to cover my bases on today. Uh, can we not conspiracy talk? Please? YouTube doesn't like that word. At all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, this is the problem I've had for a long time in that, like, there was a time in which I wanted to make a campaign setting based upon all the crazy crap going on around me. Pretend it's real for ten mm -hmm. minutes, and it'd be a really solid D&D &D setting. It seems like mm -hmm. a really cool D&D &D setting. It just also is really difficult to 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 talk about theories like that because it's like yeah they're silly they're stupid and the, none of them are not 90 percent of them are fake and made up bullshit but oh they, we're not taking it even seriously we're just kind of but 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 i think we get exactly what i get what you're saying though the other part about it is is when you do this effectively in a way that isn't offensive to people it becomes the back rooms and that's why i stopped making the con the entire setting it was great i you know it, you know okay so this is a conspiratorial this is actually just straight up funny uh, so i at one point back in 2017 2018 time frame i was really curious to see what would happen if i try to launch a ludicrous absurd campaign idea for a fictional character i've made and his name and his name was ricky mack and he was campaigning to be the governor of new jersey and one of his campaign pledge promises was to regain control of the Statue of Liberty for New Jersey. And his reasoning behind that was because all the land around the Statue of Liberty underwater is technically owned by New Jersey. And he, and he was saying that New York had stolen it and was using it to steal money away from New Jersey's uh, tourism board. All right, all right. We're going to stop now. Listen, listen. I I love the enthusiasm, guys. No. This is how we get idiots like we that's how we get an orange in the White House and a bunch of people praising conspiracy theories. No. There comes a point in time at which the irony people don't understand it's ironic. That's why you have to stop. As much as I wish it was, that's kind of exactly how we got to now, and I don't enjoy it nearly as much, and he is exactly right on this. Yeah, no, and that's true. It did, it, it was, it, it, I eventually stopped with it, but it did, I got entertainment out of it for a brief bit, and enough people seemed to catch on that it was a joke. But there were people who thought I was actually being serious, and, uh, it, 
yeah, it was a uh, it was an interesting time. I will say that I I I've definitely it. This is why, like, I think, really, if you've all, have any of you all talked about the backrooms just as, like, a really cool campaign setting and, like, idea? I, I love the backrooms. I it's mentioned cool. it yesterday on the VR stream, but I did not get to really go in-depth with it because I don't know as much as anybody else on any of it. So the idea behind the backrooms is this concept of liminal space, like... Imagine if you're just walking down a street and you make four wrong turns and then somehow you manage to make a fifth left turn into somewhere new and you're now stuck in like the infinite back rooms of a Walmart, like in between realities or something, but your brain is rendering it as like the back rooms of an office or anything else. Oh, pardon me. Didn't mean to belch there. I'm sorry, people. And it's this really cool idea of like, okay, what's in the back rooms? What are everything else is around? There's kind of this rumor that like, there isn't food there, you don't need food, but your brain needs a concept of sustenance, so you need to drink almond water. Why almond water? Well, that's what it appears to be back here. Strange. Oh. It's oh. deliciously strange. 10 out of 10 happened to, want, happened to a... Um, it's like some wonderful weird flavor to like just existence and reality and there's these things back there called smilers and the smilers like they seem to exist where there is no light and they hate light so they might be something from between realities and kind of hinted to be something of non-existence but they have like this super creepy big grin and these huge eyes kind of leering down on you and you have and they really hate things that make light and noise which kind of reinforces them being of the not and it's this wonderfully kind of creepy vibe of like you can only blind them with flashlights and run away temporarily again really want to run like a couple D, &D one shots or other like GURP style campaigns in there oh no, that figure out what system really to use that would be super cool. Also, hello, Ling. Um, they said hello. They're in chat. They just said hello. So, hello, Ling. Welcome to the chat. Hello. Um, welcome. I we're actually... Dis we're discussing all sorts of random conspiracies and things today. Uh, well, we're not discussing conspiracy anymore. We should probably... We're discussing fictional thing, Like, fictional, interesting yeah. stories now. We, we're not... Yeah, like the back rooms, if you guys are familiar with those. Because yeah. those are really fun kind of stuff. More paranormal things, you know? Yeah, more fun, more fun, easier to talk about. Uh, <laughs> so, I was actually recently writing up something, and I'm not sure if I was going to make it. It's kind of a story idea that I was planning on trying to work on um, looking at filming with a few friends, and I put aside a small budget for it. But it's, and I don't want to, I don't want to spoil too much, but the, but the, kind of the basic idea behind it because i've really been fascinated with this mix of science physics and the almost supernatural in a way um but what i wanted to come up what i came up with was this concept where you essentially have a corporation and their plan is they want to help humans ascend to the next level not through evolution necessarily but they believe that they have act. They have the ability to have almost superpowers, super intelligence, and all of this is available. But it's not something we're able to access because of our limitation in three-dimensional space. And they believe that to access it, you have to go above that. And I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but we have basically proven that there are up to 11 dimensions that are actually in the world around us we just are not able to perceive that but we have been able to show through basic through well basically particle accelerators that we actually there's i i don't want to say they're additional dimensions but essentially the way the best way to explain this is almost like they're wrapped up in each other so uh, in... Can I? I kind of want to go over a little bit of what I'm drawing right now, because oh yeah, go ahead and do that. And I'll I feel that. like we're lo I'm losing the audience <laughs> that I have. Yeah, no, yeah, you do that, and then I and I can I can just we're... I can uh, go away from the over physics stuff and just kind of go into the basic. Story. Yeah, I really. Yeah, I think this is the uh, the f foot you showed me, the uh, leg thing that you showed me in terms yes. of what you were talking about in terms of a fursuit design. I'd love to talk about this more. I 
really want to discuss this. So this right up here is basically the, the structure of the human leg and how it goes straight down, right? And then it's a foot and there's two joints in the middle here. So for this, to make a digigrade leg that is comfortable with a partial, place a piece of foam here, right around where you're right above the, uh, the Achilles heel. And all that it's going to be is essentially two pieces of foam with magnets placed down through here and a slipper at the bottom. And then all you have to do, and I'll do this in a dark green, and then all you have to do for that is fur it with a zipper down the middle around the back so then all you do is you uh, you'd slide your foot in hold hold the piece of foam up against your leg you wouldn't have to even hold it that long because you know magnets set them there and they'd rest right around here on where a legs calf would be I don't know why I'm doing this at weird angles and you just zip up here so your foot would just slide right in you know what's really interesting about this design actually is the more I'm looking at it in terms of how the fur would be tailored with the zipper you might not even need the magnets because of the closeness of how the fur would be tailored around the back end there that would hold the foam in pretty closely. And because, as furries, we can work around duct tape dummies, you can, in fact, tailor things almost perfectly to the calf of the person involved. Yeah, but there, there lies in the, the thing that I want to avoid. So with the way most digigrade legs are designed, you slide them up like a boot. So, you know, it's, it's essentially just a really tall boot with foam in the back and foam in the front and... It becomes a little bit of a hassle to slide your foot in because then you have to pull it all up and make sure it's good and whatnot and it can be kind of a hassle some people just do straight foam and then you're lifting your leg up real high and it's hard as shit to move it uh, I've just seen a lot of people struggle with that so mm -hmm. the idea here is all you would have to do is slide it in and zip it up it'd still be a slipper Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even have to worry about, you know, stretching yourself all the way out to get this this part of a leg on or, you know, sliding it all the way in or making sure it looks right. You just slide it in, magnet, zip. And this is for your full suit, correct? This is for uh, the feet for the, the full suit, yes. This is, an gotcha. this is an idea I have been ballparking for the better half of three months now. This, this whole idea started because my boyfriend is a goat, and he has hooves, and I was trying to figure out a good way to make hooves. And my first thought was really complex, and it was so complex I freaking hated it. I wasted material, I wasted foam, I got really upset and said screw it, because I got so whopper jawed. So this time around, I was like, okay, how do I work with this? And I saw these really cheap pack of, like, four or five slippers um, for, like, 15 bucks on Amazon. And I noticed they're all white. They only cover the front of the toe, and then they go to the back here. They've got a nice hard bottom so you could take them outside. And it since it's all fabric up here, you can easily attach foam balls for for toes and then you just fur over top of it so oh you know actually speaking for fursuits just real quick as a note i'm actually getting mine today oh and actually hold on just one second i'll be back oh fair enough i'm taking a break while he's gonna be back real quick to uh, check in on the chat um lang says hello hello lang um i also messaged there welcome to the chat just there um karmic is also chimed in and says hi hope the art stream is going well just got my blood drawn and for my biometrics and i'm doing okay good i hope you're doing away i'm glad to hear you're doing okay and hope you can join us soon uh he's at work today gotcha gotcha he he works all the way up till friday 
So on the weekends, we used to, what we used to do on this channel was Karmic did something on Sunday. He gotcha. used, to, used to stream on Sunday. What we do now is we essentially take, uh, I said we essentially take what he does, and I go, let's just do shorts, and we'll spend the weekend together, which is what we do now. And hello, Aru uh, Drabi. Uh, I'm doing all right. Uh, and February says you still have to get a fursuit, mainly at just ahead. Well, fun fact. Urgent Lizard here is lo uh, really good at what he does, and there's a link in the description where you can look at his uh, previous works uh, and even commission him for a fursuit. So, he's got... Personally, I love head-only commissions yes, because right. it prevents a lot of, like, you know... Um, I'm sorry, hello? Hello? Didn't mean to talk over people there. No, 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 you, no, no, you need to go. You go, you're good. Sorry. Fair enough. Anyway, yes, I absolutely love doing head-only commissions. Actually, heads are my favorite part to work on. I can do bodysuits. I'll do everything, but they're just the funnest to do. Um, I'm actually currently, while we're speaking, taping up this um, Parasaur Lophus head for personal use, just because I wanted a herbivorous dinosaur for myself in the future. Not sure why. Uh, and also, since we're about a half an hour in, I'd also like to remind everybody to like and subscribe to the video, because it is... videos take... Videos take effort, and we're trying to get to a thousand subs, and yeah, yeah, all that fun jazz. Uh, but uh, how is everybody else in the chat doing? But I did just want to note, yeah, my full. <laughs> literally, the second I stepped away, the box arrived with my full suit in it, so it is here. It is so nice. My full first. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Oh. But getting back to the idea here of the magnets, the reason why the magnets are there are just so that way then you can just slide your foot in and you don't have to pull anything up or pull anything around, really. Plus, it would allow for easier storage because the whole thing could collapse and then you'd just have a triangular piece of foam, some folded-in fur, and a slipper. Yeah, it would make it incredibly easy to pack because one of the big things I have a big concern with with any suit is I'll see a lot of beautiful suits that just don't travel well or got smashed because they're not, you know, don't have the ability to fold up and be packed well. And this seems to not have that issue. It, it solves a ton of issues, and I don't know if anybody's actually ever tried this. I've been looking, but I haven't found anything even remotely close to this. I mean, I've seen three-quarter suits similar to this before. They didn't really have, like, I mean, I'm not sure if you know what I mean by three-quarter suits because they haven't been in round in fandom for a hot minute. Um, or at least I haven't seen any. Basically, that's the idea of, like, a partial that's not just heads, hands, feet, but also heads, hands, legs, feet. So some people will do, like, the Donald Duck style, just a shirt with it. Other versions of it include something similar to this, where it's the knee down with shorts. That's something I kind of wanted to, like, explore with my characters going forward as well, just because it's, it's so damn hot, and I'm, I'm not 20 anymore. I want to continue to be able to fursuit. But having something like this, where you could have that from the knee down, and it zips up, and then the outer fur, kind of, because fur doesn't really have a stretch to it, at least good fur shouldn't, and um, that way you could wrap it around pretty easily, and that would hold everything in position really well without a lot of the problems that the boot style ones that you described had previously yeah uh and my big thing with uh i've, I've said this before on stream my first my idea for presto is to make him the first livable fursuit now that might not that sounds really fucking crazy but then it makes sense when i explain it so most fursuits trap heat like just the head alone traps a ton of heat and all of the the air in them are let out through the eyes which you're looking through in the mouth so you get air in and out through there with presto he's a 3d printed base so essentially underneath the fabric there are all of these gigantic gaping holes keeping everything structurally sound so what I can so what I then did with him was I put a small fan here which is even closer it's more like that right there and a small fan up here now I have so much room in this head my head literally only sits right here in terms of presto okay okay so what I'm going to be doing is 
attaching a larger fan that runs faster right there and two fans running along the cheeks. There's already a ton of room in the mouth. The mouth already moves. So all of the movement of the air already goes right out through my mouth. So it goes straight out this direction. The problem originally was the air was trapped right here and essentially every time I breathed it was pushing it right back in my face. With a fan, that circulates the air. The idea is to have Presto be the first fursuit where I don't have to worry about having a heat stroke because there's so much cold air that I can just, you know, relax in him for hours on end before I have to take him off. Honestly, if you have good airflow and, like, actually mind throughput, that would handle that pretty dang well. Um... What I have noticed in terms of tailoring a bunch of my suits over the years, um, I did start in a Mercedes background, which does have a higher heat load than a lot of other things, and one of the big issues that they had and seemed to work out really well, which seems counterintuitive, is a, tyler, a more tightly tailored head actually helps vent heat more. Because the fact that there is, unless you do have extra fans to circulate that air, having that extra layer of air heat just is an air gap that traps that heat. I try to tailor my heads a lot closer to the mouth for that reason, to allow the airflow to go through. There are exceptions to this, like again in the case with Karmic and glasses, we'll have to offset that because the fan itself is also going to help fix the fogging issue with the glasses itself. Yeah. One of the big things that I have found to work really well with long-term suiting, and I tailor every single one of my suit heads around, is... Um, are you familiar with Easy Cool Vests and Easy Cool Collars? Yes, I am. Uh, those things are amazing. An Easy Cool Collar is probably the single best thing you can add to any partial or full suit for that matter to add a level of venting. The vests are great, but they're hard to wear if you're a tiny person like me, or, you know, might vary in weight a little bit. But those collars, because it's just literally an ice pack right on your jugular vein at 40 degrees, you're just, you don't have to care for hours. It's amazing. That, that works. That's cool. My initial worry, though, was with the sweat. I hate sweat. It bothers me. Like, when it's on my skin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I already had problem when, when I originally had Presto made, when I made him, I didn't realize how much my glasses were going to fog up. They were constant. With the airflow, though, from up here and in the nose, it actually kept uh, the glasses from fogging up, but I was still sweating. Which the idea is, if I can take in more air from these holes, the better it'll be breathability wise the better it'll Absolutely. be for that essentially i want to rush air all the way through the suit cooling vests and stuff work but i want to make it so i can easily put him on without having to oh i gotta put on the vest i gotta put on a collar i gotta put on a balaclava i have to put on this and that and then the suit you want to just you know be able to put on go take off go and that kind of very organic vibe throughout a convention Exactly. Totally get that. Totally get that. Um, one of the things that I also really recommend with an airflow throughput, um, if you look at how the ears are on a suit, right uh, underneath them is a great place to have an event. 100%. I didn't, get, I didn't get to explore this with Presto, but maybe in the future. I'm thinking in a next, another version of Presto, in terms of a design, he does have the right kinds of ears for it. A lot of people with bunnies or narrower ears or things that are not like canids or vulpids decide to not have that beyond strap, but I don't think that's appropriate just because you just use a smaller, a little bit higher of a throughput fan. Even like, even on something like Karmic, that might be an option to have one underneath. I'm not quite sure yet if I can get that working well with a lop, but you should have enough outspots, even with Karmic slop, to make that work well. So with um, Karmic, I actually drew up an original concept for airflow in his head. I was originally going to make Karmic the first uh, livable fursuit. This has been a concept in my head for damn near three or four years now. The original idea, because he has the ears that flop down and the nose with the little things, was to make this completely hollow, 
place fans in here, output vents through here with fans that go this direction. So basically, air comes in through the mouth and out through the ears, which was the original idea. I realized, though, after taking a look at more fursuit heads, this was not so much viable because the ear would constantly flop up due to the fan or plug up that hole, making it inaccessible. Um, Again, that is my current concern, which is actually why the head is being sculpted in such a way that you will vent out through the eyes. Which is This will also help with the whole fogging issue. Which is great. Um, feel free to take any of these ideas that we are bringing up today. If you're a recent maker or not these are all really good ideas for how to best cool a fursuit absolutely and also to remind everybody the furry fandom isn't about like having oh no these are my exclusive techniques no please steal everything i want to bring all fursuits forward further and take every single idea i have and use it for you forever and do it better i want to see what you do exactly so i'm probably going to be the first one to do this design just because i have plans to finish this up within the following next couple months or so but i if somebody else does it faster send it to me i've got a twitter at gavin dragon yt i'd love to see somebody do this well before me sounds like i need to get to my 3d printer and do it first <laughs> no, I'm, just kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm not artistically talented like that but i just wanted to quickly uh jump in i probably need to go for a bit because i want to go try on my fursuit because i you know i'm excited for him so send send I'm pictures send yes, pictures we, we demand the pics pics or didn't happen yes yes ah, gotcha well i will definitely then do that but yeah i'm gonna go try him on see how he is and all that jazz and oh i cannot wait to show him off at persona con in september love well, excited to see so. him um all right, hit y'all up later, boy. I hope the chat is enjoying our little discussion here. I know that not everybody's into fursuits or fursuiting, but this could really go for any cosplay. That requires a mask. Oh, absolutely. Abs you can find, um, I've seen plague doctors at the Renaissance Festival steal a thousand percent of our techniques to not die, and I really respect them for that. I have seen... Uh, people who do like helmet designs like uh, for lack of a better idea uh, like a proto man or a sniper joe helmet for mega man where they've got fans running near the earpiece you know because not that's cool because not everybody can do a n not everybody's gonna buy a biker helmet cut it up to pieces to make it work some people are going to literally go out and 3d print something and i've seen them run fans through the earpiece i've seen them uh just try to keep that glass from fogging up with the breath i've seen vents down here like a regular biker's helmet just stuff that make it easier to wear throughout a convention or even out in public because yeah you know why not Oh, exactly. And it's really interesting just from a standpoint of seeing how different fursuiting is from a lot of other cosplay disciplines and how watching those techniques going back and forth has resulted in a lot of really good boost to it. It's like Protogen. Entire Protogen entirely came to us out of like much more of the like smooth armor, like kind of daft punk helmety cyberpunk vibes. And they're amazing. Another interesting example of this is, though, is, like, the concept of a cosplay holding up for five, six years doesn't exist in those realms in the same way it does with fursuiting. It's really interesting exactly how durable our costumes are compared to everybody else in nerd and fandom. Exactly. Um, speaking of costumes like helmets and stuff, there is a band called the Proto Men, and with their act, they have multiple helmets and face masks and things that they have hooked up microphones and aux cables to the back of the helmets and in the designs it looks like it's in the designs for like their comics and stuff it looks like it links back to their backs on stage they're hooked up to aux uh to uh speakers and microphones so that way then they can sing in the helmets 
That's cool. That's actually really cool. In fact, there's a little synthesizer in two of them, so it can sound more robotic. I want a robot synth protogen band now. Somebody do it. Uh, <laughs> make Please it to be. Make it some rock and roll, so I'll actually enjoy it. <laughs> Honestly, I don't feel that the furry fandom has enough uh, rock and roll musicians. I mean, have you heard of Run Definitely Run? Yes, I have. But when I when I say that, though, I mean enough of them that travel to conventions and stuff. Because all yeah, absolutely, because we've got like that folky country sound from Pepper Coyote, and he just dragged all over the fucking place, even though he really doesn't understand shit. Um, like, he is dumber than a sack of, sh uh, of fucking bricks at times. Um, no, off no, no offense to Pepper. I've met him before. He's nice, but still. He can be... It's a... <laughs> it's a matter of being able... It's, there's a level of holding that up that will prevent him from being able to show up to things in the future, and I'm not happy about that. It makes me sad. But that's okay. Yeah. It's a matter of... We also have that around. I mean... The big concern, and I mean, the other thing is, like, I don't understand why there isn't more of this really interesting interplay between music and furry. Like, I have, there's all of these really cool raves. They've always been centralized attracting points at conventions. There's all of these really cool musicians around. I mean, a lot of them do do EDM stuff. I mean, crap, if you want to do in broader culture, there was a music video featuring um, Dorian Erectra and Pussy Riot and a very, very, um in um, something called My Agenda, which was a fascinating and wonderfully well-done vibe, and I wasn't expecting that many fursuits in a mainstream music video. Uh, speaking of stuff, uh, one of the people who I I hang out with at conventions at time from time to time is Yellowcake, and he's a DJ, on top of being also a fursuit maker and a chemist. Um, he's really cool at what he does, but I, I'm also not much of a DJing kind of person. I'm more of a play some classic rock, and I'm, I'm there. I'm all for it. So I think we just need more of that sound in general. Because it's it gets harder and harder to find that sort of sound. Like, we have stuff like Greta Van Fleet, but that's, that's not even, like, furry-related. Exactly. I mean, and the one thing that, like, a bunch of things I have heard from musicians both locally and across the fandom nationally has been, it, we need to do a better job of supporting them. We need to, like, say, do the basic job of paying for their rooms at conventions, compensating them to be there, making sure that everything else is handled on the back end, and then you will have them show up. We just haven't really done that as well, and that's why they aren't here, and that makes me a little sad. We can do that. I think we should actually focus on doing that, and we can have all of these cool extra sounds and stuff in the fandom. We just need to start making environments for non-visual artists the way we've done a really good job of making environments for visual artists. Yeah. It's the whole reason I'm able to do streams like this, and they do all right, is because I, visual medium for furries is really easy to showcase the ears and the tail and all that fun jazz, but when it comes to literally anything else, it's it's harder. Like, animation, yeah, sure. That's kind of sort of how it started. Artwork, comics, super easy. Music, it gets trickier, because we don't want... Because not everybody wants to sing about overtly furry topics, but you can be a furry and sit and be a musician, which is, you know, I think the best way to do it, honestly, is just put out good music. But the fandom just doesn't do a good job of recognizing them. I think part of it's also just welcoming in artists that are furry, as well as furry art. Yeah. It's a matter of in celebrating the whole artists and bringing them in and bringing them in as cultural aspects and cultural attaches, even if we cannot say that this particular thing is directly anthropomorphic. The other question is, like, different spaces. Could you have a furry-informed rave, for example? It might not be a furry-specific rave, but you have a bunch of furry musicians on staff, and it's for everyone. That might be a really good way to start approaching and engaging with your local communities as well, you know? Yeah. 
Um, I kind of want to get back to the topic of fursuits. Yes. I know we walked away from that for a little bit, but I think I think that's really where you sh you you are really strong with that. Um, oh, absolutely. Again, my ADHD is showing, so feel free to continue to redirect. Oh, me. you're fine. I'm good with I I'm good with topics flowing freely. Um, so back to the topic of fursuit heads, um, in particular. So one issue is with the glasses thing, right? Um, and the airflow. But another massive problem I've noticed with fursuit heads is visibility. And Absolutely. Some suitors, you know, they accept being blind while they're in a suit head. I think that if we were to, I don't know, either work with larger eyes or use slightly different materials. I don't know if you've ever looked back at any of the older style fursuits. Everybody, a lot of people like to talk about about older style fursuits like they're something terrible, but some of them were pretty good and some of them had a lot of really good ideas that we just don't see anymore. It was very much so, having been there myself, when a lot of good things and not so good things and things we'll never talk about again were being tried, there were a lot of really interesting ideas that came through. One of the ideas that I was originally going to try with Presto was we found this plastic mesh that it said in old fursuits to use. The problem was it was really hard to paint. But it was super easy to see through, and from pretty far away, or even fairly up close, it makes it super easy to see through. I ended up going with a more traditional printed mesh, because more people... I basically held a pole, because I liked both of them. But it's like, if I were to look through something like this, right here, you can see through it. Not as well as you could see through something like that. <laughs> so, that's an idea right there. I, I feel like finding easier to see through methods. I know that some people have used screens to, uh, to do stuff with, and then, but it's a... And here's an idea, because we have the ability to put a visual, like, animated image on a, on a piece of glass pane. And it would cover up whatever is behind it. So why not, in a fursuit head, use this glass pane medium, animate an eye over top of it, make it animate and move or do whatever, and hook it up into a battery so that way then you could see straight through it and you're, you're talking about like um a lot of setups that synths and protogen already have where basically their entire face is like a glass except it's just this particular part and you could see through the back end of the projective screen yep just interesting uh, I've, I saw an animated eye at a convention, but the way they did it irked me. They had a standard screen right here, and then they'd animate the eye, and then it was a dark mesh, and you had to look through this much space. Oh, uh, they did tear deck vision. Yep. Which is okay. But I feel like, at that point, you kind of sort of need a handler. And speaking... I mean, you can get away without tear duct... You can get away without a handler if you have a moving jaw in that kind of suit, because people don't talk about how much you look through your mouth in tear duct vision suits. This is what Argent is. Um, yeah. And this is also part of the reason why I'm making a different Parasaur, so I don't have to deal with that kind of a suit anymore. Um, I'm not sure, and I'll have to look into this, because, like, a lot of the protogen you see that kind of have that quote-unquote screen face, 
it's not a true screen. They have an array of LEDs that kind of has this slotted, almost sunglass-like cover on top of it, and they're using the diffusion of the sunglass cover to do that. You also look through it. You still kind of have that limited visibility because of the sunglass in dark areas, but it's very much so a physical LED array that they're looking through, not a screen. Uh, hello, Skylish fan, uh, and no, Mountain Man is not here today. Uh, I am with Doodle Owl and... Uh, myself and then Oxide was here and he just left. Um, oh boy. Anyways, back to what we were talking about. Um, so, oh yes. So the one thing that I wanted to tell you about Protogens is I kind of wanted to talk about the way that my friend Yellowcake has put up his suit, which is the proto, well, his Protogen suit. So what he did was, this is all opaque glass, but then to make it easy on himself, he's got a, he's got two LED, thing, uh, LED panels, and he can see through 90% of it, and then these LED panels are what animate and move, and it's all in opaque glass. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's basically just the four panels and everything around it's something he can see through, but he cannot see through the physical panels themselves. Yes, but the, these panels are like, I don't know, like seven or eight rows of LEDs? There's not very many. There are enough to make an eye and make a couple patterns, do some fun stuff, visualizer things, but nothing too massive. You know, and most of the time when I see, like, a really well-animated screen in a protogen suit that's, like, in that ear disc, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Yep, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, this is an interesting approach to it, so, like, I think it's very easy to get that level of intense visibility as well as airflow in things like synths and protogen that have that very techy kind of face. But how do we do it well in, you know, soft, well-sculpted foam? or something beyond foam. Another thing that I saw that I think was really, really interesting out of, weirdly enough, um, Eastern European and Russian furries was uh, they don't have access to the same kinds of foams that we do. So they'll use stuff like the pool noodle foam to make big, hard shapes. And what that is is it's a foam head, but it has kind of that internal hollowness that like a resin casted one does. And it's a very nice, solid mounting point for fans. And because it's like, you know, that pool noodle stuff, you can wipe off the inside from a cleanliness standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, I know exactly what you're talking about there. We are So when we did Presto's ear, I used the wrong kind of foam, completely wrong kind. So, instead of getting this look, which I was going for, I would have had that. <laughs> what we ended up doing was, we stuck, we broke apart a bunch of coat hangers. And snapped off from there to there, and stuck them in, in from the straightest point down. So now, it's super solid... The problem I f am having is that it's not attaching real well, but I've, I, I can literally, since, since there's all of these holes up through here, I can literally reattach it through the, uh, plastic. It's super easy to do. The, the, one of the big things that I found with ears that was hard to do is how everything's kind of curved into a U as opposed to a straight up and down thing. It's really hard to get it to meld to the roundness of your head otherwise. Good news about plastic bases, it's very easy to just continually reattach like that, which is one of the things that was really nerve-wracking to me when I switched over to foam carving about having making sure everything could fit right. But in terms of, like, the actual way I recommend doing is you just kind of follow the outside shape of the ear with your wire, and then you will physically bend the foam in, and then you'll just kind of tweak it until it sits right on the back of the curve of the head. That's a really good idea. Uh, the thing was, though, we weren't using wire coat hangers. We were using plastic coat hangers. Ooh. We literally had to break two coat hangers and give it a shot, and it just ever so happened to work, and you can't even tell. I'm actually really impressed by that. I've never heard of plastic working that well. It probably saves you a lot on weight. 
Oh, 100%. My head is actually lighter than Karmic's right now. Uh, and we didn't stick it all the way through. It only goes to about right there. So if you notice on Presto, uh, he's got a green bit at the very top, and then it's white all the way through. It stops just before that green bit, so I can fold it, mess with it. If I walk through a doorway and it hits the top there, I don't have to worry about it. It'll go, it, it'll bounce right back to where it was at. Realist. I might actually steal that, actually, because I've been doing a bunch of experiments. I mean, part of the reason why I tackled a parasaur as a dinosaur in terms of a suit is because they have that ridiculous crest. How do I make that work and look good and not bounce off of my head and not, you know, decapitate myself whenever I walk through a doorway? Oh, yeah. I totally get that. I think... Uh... Also, sorry, I've been we've been kind of ignoring the chat today. It's it's all just discussion. This is more meant to this is more meant to be a part one to a video that's coming out next week. So, so it, bear with us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Again, we will be much more prepared in the future. But I'm having a wonderful time discussing things. And please continue to ask me questions from the chat as well. Also, hello, Skylar's fans and more. Hello, he says hi, Gavin. Is Mountain Man in the stream today? I don't believe so. Again, nope. I am new, so I don't know names as well. Mountain, Ma um, uh, Mountain Man comes on quite a bit, uh, but he's at, he's got work, I believe, throughout the rest of the rest of the little while. He probably won't be here till like next week, sometime. Totally fair. I am just hanging out with y'all on this wonderful Wednesday afternoon, so I don't expect much. So going on, and he asks, um, "How are you and Mountain Man doing?" I can't speak for Mountain Man, but I'm doing okay. Um, one of the thing, one of the design things, and this is more of an art thing than an actual design thing. I am a massive Mega Man nut. I love that series to death, to the point where I won't shut up about it once I get started on it. Um, one of the design thing I like about your Raptor is right over the ear, just a giant circle. Love it. <laughs> Isn't it wonderfully aesthetic? Nobody uses it. They're it's... actually from iguanas. They're called tympaniums. They aren't accurate to the species at all, but it just adds such that extra vibe. I don't know why just to have the ear disc adds so much to it. The other design thing was the arch that goes around to the back. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So, like, here you can kind of see it with, with what I've drawn. But the way this matches up way too well with this character I love... I don't know if you've ever played the Mega Man games. I've never played Mega Man directly, but I've always kind of loved that era of video gaming and that style of art and that kind of like, but somewhere between that and Astro Boy in terms of that era of anime. So I guess I didn't really consciously think about it ever bleeding through from the character before, but you're not wrong. Is the, the the centralized crest on the kind of helmet kind of comes through. With, you so 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 here we go. We've got the circle on the ear. Here, here's just a rough sketch of Mega Man. So we've got the circle on the ear. We've got the crest that goes around to the back. We've got the spiky, mohawky sort of central piece. And then your eyes are right there. <laughs> Never thought about this before. Really happy about it. I am Mega Man the Dinosaur. Damn it. <laughs> uh, I evolved the helmet before anybody realized it actually was the thing. So that's fun. Um, I think the best part about that, though, is that we talked about Dino Crisis. That was the same like studio and part of the same team. <laughs> that great and Cap comedy is my favorite stuff. Yeah, Capcom stuff is ridiculously good and fun, and that's why I love taking inspiration from their stuff. Like, believe it or not, I was on Twitter on my personal account, and I was messing around, and I saw somebody. Uh, who does... Don't look this up. Uh, it's called Bandit Tales. Okay, okay. Uh, they do lovely art. I, I love their work a ton, but it is definitely not for the... Uh, not for those that would be looking around the YouTube space, to say the least. Fair. Um, well, I, I... He posted a picture of himself, and I said, You look like Leon S. Kennedy. And he goes... I love Resident Evil. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> it just yeah, makes, been... makes me chuckle. 
Alrighty, so give me, like, if there's one Capcom title that just is kind of below, like, nobody pays attention to, that's your absolute favorite. Say it. Uh, well, I'd, I'd have to say Mega Man, but more, that's more, fair, honestly. more and more people, like, right now, we are on the verge of a new renaissance for the series. Uh, so the best-selling game in that series is actually Mega Man 2. Interesting, okay. Uh, and that was released just about over, just about 30 years ago. Almost 35. And um, nowadays, Mega Man 11, which came out 2018, is the second best-selling game, and it's not slowing down. It's going to take that title of best-selling Mega Man title in a bit. Nice. It's, okay. It's overall Capcom's fourth biggest moneymaker. And it's their biggest money maker in terms of the mobile mobile gaming space, which is absurd, because they've only put out one mobile game that actually had microtransactions. But it's so well designed that I've actually recommended Mega Man X Dive on this channel before because they're not intrusive, they're not bad, and the game's been out since 2019-ish, and still getting support. Awesome sauce. I mean, as long as I'm not insulted by the microtransactions, I'm actually not a huge, hugely against them the same way as a lot of people. I generally am against them, and in this, for some reason in this game, they just designed it so well that you don't have to... Like, if you get a character and it's like, oh, I didn't want to get Vile, you can still play through the stages with Vile and still kick-ass take names, and you might end up liking the character by the end. But they, they throw so many different weapons at you that, yeah, you might not like a special, but at least you can, like, make a swarm of bees go towards something because you're using uh, Hornet Man's weapon as your base weapon. I mean, the way I've always felt about it is, um, are you familiar with, in Magic the Gathering, which is, I mean, I love it, but it is the definition of microtransaction, the musical. 100%. Um, I, I am familiar only because I play a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh! from time to time. Oh, so you know. Um, but like, in traditional trading card games, there's this concept of Johnny, Timmy, and Spike. And Johnny really likes playing with cool combos, really likes getting through and doing, playing with all the cards and enjoying the game. Timmy is really happy that his mom let him buy two blue eyes white dragon and that's how he's gonna win the game um and then you have spike and spike wants to win and spike doesn't care how spike gets there and you kind of run into this kind of dynamic with all your players like over and over again in various different games and a lot of the problems i have with microtransactions is like okay cool spike's gonna win spike can buy all the fancy things fine it's kind of a single player phone game that's cool he can have fun over there but I, as Johnny, want to play the game. Yeah. If I have that option, then I'm absolutely in. And this sounds exactly like the case. Uh, yeah, they have a multiplayer mode with um, where it's just battles. It's 3v3 and you're put on teams. But that's not like the main focus. The main focus is on actually platforming through like six or seven stages and fighting a boss. At the end of each. And that's all single player. Again, that sounds to me exactly what I wanted of a phone game, which is a really cool game. Like, a nice, solid platformer that I can just pull up and do in between stuff. I think the nice part is that it's not strictly mobile. There, there's a, People have dug through the code and have found, oh, they're planning a PS5 port, an X1, a PS4, a Switch port, and it's already on Steam, so... Hell yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, this sounds amazing, actually. Yeah, I, I, that's one of those things where it's like, I have recommended this game way too many times, and... I haven't heard any major complaints from people, other than, damn it, the American server doesn't have the character I want yet. <laughs> because the Chinese server is the main one where you get stuff. Because it was uh, developed by Capcom, uh, J uh, Capcom China. Which is I mean, upsetting, but eh. I mean, America has never been Capcom's primary market, and that's okay. Uh... Not true, but yeah. I mean, okay, fair. There are, I guess, yeah, there was that interesting time frame in the middle ground there, like mid-2000s, which I will respect. Uh, well, I mean, everything that they do does better over here than they do in Japan. I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah, uh, Street Fighter's the only one where it's like, it does better competitively in 
uh, Japan, but it does better sales-wise over here. Uh, Resident Evil does way better over here, uh, to the point where they don't even bother, they didn't even bother dubbing the games for a really long time in Japanese, they just gave them subtitles. Um, Damn, okay. Like, even the first game, they didn't even dub it in Japanese, it's still English. Oh, uh, right, because this would have been, like, the same thing with the Silent Hill series, if I remember correctly, is it was Japanese studios specifically marketing to a North American audience, which is why James Sunderland has the funniest voice acting of all time. Yeah, and then Devil May Cry is heavily, Jap heavily Japanese-inspired, and it's goofy and silly, but that's another game series where it actually does better in the West because of all of the guns and the gunplay. Interesting. Like, Warframe as a game is in a similar, like, corner, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. Yeah, no, that's the, the FPS MMO market was never a genre that I felt was a good idea, but Warframe proved to me that it could work and could work well. But that's a very, like, it's interesting because it's a very, like, it's not as gun-focused as any other shooter I've ever played. It's almost like gunplay as a martial art, and that's a pretty interesting vibe. Ah, uh, that sounds a lot like the... Uh, oh shoot, what is it? Uh, there, there was a lot of, like... There's a movie... It's, there's... I forget who it is. Who make, They make a lot of movies who where it's like, all of the gunplay shots are, like, dancing... And, like, a martial art instead of an actual, like, gunfight. Oh, that was, like, John Wick, basically. But yeah! I know who you're the, the, that crew, I, I know who you're talking about. The, the term is gun kata, but it's very, like, actually, weirdly enough, a Japanese invention. From yes. the 80s, I believe. Yes, yes. Which is just, again, approach it as a... It's so beautiful, actually. Like, the, you don't think about the fact that the original John Wick only had eight stuntmen. Really? I haven't even seen the John Wick movies, but I do want to watch them. Uh, yeah. it's I recommend the first one. They do get, they kind of lose the thread later, but they're still a lot of fun. Definitely recommended. But the first one was really because basically the first one they spent the entire budget on um, Keanu Reeves, literally the entire budget. And so what they did is they had like seven or eight really solid stuntmen, and they would film different scenes at different times with them having shaved their heads, shaved their beards, or just showing up completely like with all of their hair to make it be different stuntmen in different scenes. And so, but because there was a solid, like, only eight stuntmen, everybody was so familiar with each other's fighting styles and how this would work. It's an incredibly beautiful, flowy statement of gunplay. Yeah, these these are all things that if you're an amateur filmmaker, like, go nuts with these. <laughs> the, Please we, do. Please do. We, we want to see more... Devil May Cry ridiculousness on these theater screens. We want to see more craziness. Stuff that's like, this, is un this isn't this is believable in the slightest, but I'm having so much fun I don't give a shit. Or even if it is believable, make it the kind of believable where I'm like, damn, you did a really good job of attention to detail to set it all up and make the scene gloriously ridiculous. You didn't pull back with it, you made it more. Yeah. Um... I think, I think what makes us more qualified to talk about, like, scenes like this than most most people on the internet who just want to talk about this stuff is, since we've made fursuits and stuff, we've, there, we've essentially made giant, long-lasting props. Oh, absolutely. And I... Um, it... And me in particular, I've actually made a couple of smaller props for a movie a sh well not a movie but like a short like thing that is probably never going to come out because i don't have the time for it anymore but uh that one's yeah, good. never say never yeah yeah i i, I do want to try it someday but i doubt i'll ever get to I mean, the thing that I always like to point out in specifically in fandom in regards to animation is uh, the has been hope tell people were headlining MFF in 2018. That wasn't that long ago. Right, but this isn't an animation. This is this was straight up a uh, short film thing that I wanted to shoot. I actually still have the only prop that I made for it. Ooh, no, um, please. I guess that's my point though. Is it, as much as it might seem like it's a thousand miles away, 
go ahead and do it anyway, because that can, that's the only way to see how far it can go. And things generally come together faster than you might think otherwise. Yeah, I, I would like to give it a shot, I just don't have the, the people for it, more or less. Um, because essentially what it originally was, was I took a film class in high school that was going to let us use the film cameras. You use these school's cameras, uh, to shoot stuff. And they used to let, uh, let them, let us do it, uh, on the regular. Every, every year there'd be at least one small film made, uh, until my year, which was the, the final year for this, because... Uh, somebody decided to break the camera, and the school had to pay out like a thousand dollars just to get the camera, and said, "Yep, yeah, nope, you're not allowed to use these." Uh, uh. So, um, I just never got to, a chance to make it, even though I had the props and part of a script written. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I am a big, big Mega Man nut, so I guess it goes without question. I, I like a lot of Super Sentai and Power Rangers style things, right? Um, that whole thing was supposed to be like... I had come up with an idea for a Power Rangers series that was... Less so about the goofiness and more so about what happens when... Some bad people give the wrong people their tools. Okay. So, like, the villains end up giving the heroes, like, tools. Because they think, ah, they're teenagers, they'll go cause havoc. We can't use these tools, so maybe they can. And once they have these tools, they'll end up uh, wreaking havoc for us. Instead, they ended up, you know, turning on them and finding out that, oh, there's this giant ring of, of a cult that, from space that is, you know, evil. And the whole, the whole, like, short script thing was supposed to be about one of them getting this power and beginning to turn. And it was supposed to have one fight scene, one transformation scene, and some short build-up. And I was going to film it and pitch it to some people and see uh, if we could get it made. At the time, you know, I had the perfect place to film. I had... It was, there was a park near my uh, near my house. I had a lot of my friends ready to go for it, but once we realized we didn't have the cameras and we wouldn't be graded on this, and it was senior year, uh, we just kind of didn't end up making it. Well, as soon as you say not graded on it senior year, anything else begins to happen in the eternal summer. Exactly. Uh, but then the eternal summer of me going and working every single day because of job and mom wanting me to have a work a normal schedule and shit you know eventually everything just starts falling apart and it's like ah oh, okay it makes more sense why you didn't make this i still have the prop though it is a small 3d printed wrist mounted morpher and when you hit the button it should it was supposed to shoot out a small sword i didn't get to print that sword piece but it was a fun design. It's also like the only thing that I've ever actually 3D printed and kept around. Honestly, this sounds like a dope design. Do you still have like plans for it? Uh, I not... have a bunch of 3D printers because a wrist-mounted sword launcher just sounds amazing. No <laughs> questions. Just, just straight up. Yeah, I I still have I still have it. I just don't have it put together and assembled, and I don't have the files for the little sword anymore. <laughs> Uh, literally any little toy sword would work, probably. Fair, fair, fair. I'll, like, go digging for some models and or maybe commission someone. <laughs> yeah, and until I have a better solid plan to use it, I'm not going to focus on that as a project, though. Just more so because I actually like to get stuff done, and I I've noticed something about myself that if I, I plan something out for the long term, if I'm not just going to go do it, I have problems picking it back up. Which that is, is incredible. Which is actually why commissions both take me no time at all and all the time in the world. Don't call me out like that. I feel you. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to call you out. Um, 
but... No, 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 I'm just saying that's exactly the same kind of workflow I kind of have, is I need to get it done as quickly as possible. I need to keep a good pace up, because if I don't otherwise, things will fall through the cracks. Like, I have, I believe, two commissions right now for people, and I'm not taking any more right now because I want to get them done. I want to get done the commissions that I have, but I don't have the energy or the or feel the need to really start working on them until, like, midway through. Luckily, you know, they haven't been waiting that long. This is, like, t at tops, like, a month, maybe, which isn't that long to wait for a commission. And they'll be done by the end of the month, guaranteed, because I'll want to start working on Presto as soon as I can. But still. <laughs> exactly. It's ADHD life with the workflow. Uh... Like, I'm happy I finally have everything done right before frigging Denver. I made the mistake, so... I wish I had a more G-rated way to put this, but there was this friend I had who had a husky, and he had it tailored so wrong that I had to reconstruct his entire butt. Oh, wow. Like, completely, like, somehow everything had been tailored so high, it was the worst camel toe I have ever seen on a dude in any garment, which is really impressive considering the pile of fur usually hides that. How do you say that name? I don't know how to say that name, but hello, whoever says emotional damage. I can't. Leal Desmoza? I would love to hear how you pronounce your name if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to spell that out, please go right on ahead. Um, regardless, yeah, no. I've, I've seen the opposite, too. Which is infuriating, which is, uh, everything's too low. What do you mean by too low? I saw somebody who was possibly about six foot in a full fursuit. And, uh, this suit was tailored for somebody who looked to be about eight foot tall. That tail was low enough to lower, like, the tail was attached to the, the suit itself, so it wasn't like it came through a hole or anything. It was, I, I'm not even kidding, it was just underneath where the groin was. Like, like, I get a dropped crotch, but usually you see those with the, like, you tailor the tail around the tailbone. Ah. Yeah, this was like, they duct tape dummied somebody who was eight feet tall, sent it in, and then they gave it to somebody who was, like, six foot. I mean, that might be a case of somebody trying to do things for measurement and not duct tape dummying at all. Maybe, I don't know. I, all I know is I saw it and I didn't say anything. But I kind of chuckled when I saw it. I mean, that's the appropriate response, but... I, I, the, the head was cute. It, that looked like it fit fine. But everything else just looked way too baggy. Kind of made me giggle. Um, I know that I just keep doing smaller doodles of things and <laughs> skipping on, but... Oh, I mean, that's actually half the half way to do, like, good art is just kind of doing drills and finding good stuff. So you've been pretty impressed. Everything's been slightly Mega Man and or helmet themed. Well, that's just kind of... It's the mood I'm in, so... There. I mean, I said beforehand, I didn't really feel like drawing today. I felt like playing, just playing video games. <laughs> I mean, that's... that's fair. Oh, speaking before, I'm like, I've been taping this Parasaur the entire time. I'm going to send you pictures. Yes, uh, I could put them on stream if you'd like. That would be amazing, actually. Yeah, go ahead and send me a couple photos. What's great about this art program is I can literally drag and drop uh, image files. Sweetness, actually. That's really good. I'm over here, like, parting like it's 2006, trying to struggle around the stream, and everybody's in the future already. Uh, yeah, I would do... I would do what I normally do with some of this stuff. And, uh... Like, stream it to you. Discord does not like my art program. Weird. Discord, it'll start flashing the screen really fast because it can't tell what I'm actually doing. I'm just going to show off this first one here because that's... You're probably the best one in this case. Yeah. He's got the eyes mounted. Uh, yeah. 
Actually, speaking of eyes, that, that was something that I don't think Karmic mentioned to you, and I know I haven't mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. uh, his eyes are shaped like diamonds. His pupils are, at least. That's diamonds? Yeah, that's pretty easy to paint, actually. Yeah, so... Everything's hand-painted, so it should be pretty easy to do that. I will keep that in mind. Let me add that to the notes here real quick. It's really subtle. It's like... It's like this, and then... Yeah, that makes sense. So you have the kind of the little, um, it's it's not a big one, almost like a cat eye, but very subtle kind of diamond, and then you have your highlights coming in from the upper top. Uh, for those in chat who want to know why I did it, like, designed him like that, it's because goat eyes are square! Oh. So I... <laughs> That's brilliant, because I've had so many issues designing goat characters before how to get the square kind of pupil in there without it being overwhelmingly creepy. So I tilted it on its head for funness, and, uh, yeah. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, but yes, this is Doodle Owl's quality right here. It's very high quality. I recommend his suits wholeheartedly. Well, let me send you some actual, like, finished images as well for a moment. Uh, yeah, if you've got some that aren't already on your website. I think I have, yeah, there's one that ended up with me at AC this year. I'll bring that one, as well as this glorious coyote. This coyote is currently owned by someone I don't know over in California. I hope they really enjoy it. Cool. See, that's the nice part about me doing this stuff and me being, making friends with doodle owl before we actually did any of this stuff is it makes it super easy for me to just be like outside of commissioning it's just easy for me to be like hey man let's just hang out for a bit and while i draw i mean amazingly actually it's one of the really fun things i enjoy about being in fandom in general is is like it's this harsh like you're this particular vibe of whatever else around the commissioner. No, it's a really nice free flow between everyone. I don't have to worry about whatever else, you know? Yeah. Uh, it makes it easy for me to actually work on stuff. And while we are discussing... Yeah, I'm just going to use that first one because that works. You're... Mm -hmm. The angle's kind of weird on the other one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm still getting used to taking pictures. Please bear with me. Oh, you're fine. You're absolutely okay. If um, anybody in chat knows anything about composition, please tell me, because I'm still trying to figure out how to into photog photography. I do, but I'm not going to bring it up right now. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm not the best at it either. I just know a thing or two. Um, but going on about fursuits, right? So, like, they're easy... Well, the foam base is kind of easy to critique. You can tell when it's a good one. Yep. Um, but when when you go to the full full suit, I've uh... okay. I see something here that I didn't do with Presto that somebody told me to do, and I didn't want to do it because no. Um, <laughs> so somebody told me they like third day of the first convention with Presto is that that's a really good suit but then they told me all of the fur should be pointed this way and they meant all of it and I looked at them like they were fucking crazy especially because Presto's a bunny I don't know if you know this about bunny fur. It goes straight down. It doesn't go back. It doesn't go back like a wolf's. Interesting. Okay. I mean, this is one of the interesting debates I've seen in regards to different species. Especially things like um, guinea pigs, bunnies with rosettes and stuff like that. Is What do I do if my character's fur specifically does not go in a direction? Um, I do, the problem with anthropism in terms of, you know, we are making anthros to our own 
ideas in our heads regarding these animals, not how they are in many cases. And so what might read better to an audience is keeping everything in always the correct direction. I personally always do. Sometimes I'll force correct the direction differently, like around the very edge of the muzzle where you can see the cream meets the brown, I kind of had to take a blow dryer and force that down a little bit further so it continued to do so. But on something like a coyote, you need it to, um, you all of the fur goes towards the tip of the ears and down towards the tip of the paws, starting from the nose. Most creatures, when you fur them, that is the best way to approach it, especially in terms of a fursuit, because also that's the thing that will look the best and hold up the best over time. Because also, when you pet it, you go usually go from the back to the front, and that way you're not messing up the fur. It can go with the thing of it. Yeah, um, with Presto, he goes, his fur goes straight down, and then it goes down around the nose the nose is just felt attached which makes it easy for the fur to go like this and then presto's mouth it goes back and down so it goes down this way which that is exactly how it works with um like any particular canid suit i would recommend in most cases with lagomorph suits and bunnies to retain the nose back vibe with the understanding that it is inaccurate to the species because when you make stuff for fursuits it makes sense to work around the limitation of fursuits as well as the limitation of species itself I think this was a big flaw years back when everybody tried to kind of focus on the hyper realism stuff and why a lot of those suits didn't hold up and work out as well so I actually have I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these two real fast. Uh, totally fair. So one of the thi one of the people who I met at my first ever convention did hyper realistic suits, and this is gonna be a buyer beware sort of thing. I don't believe they make suits anymore. Okay, fair. They skipped town a couple times. But, oh. uh, <laughs> they sold, I believe, two suits total. They made only hyper-realistic suits, and they didn't use anything of any color. So, it was all gr it was, it was the most Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 color scheme I've ever seen. Brown, brown, and brown. Uh, it was gray, browns, it was dark colors that just... Like, not like, oh, that's a dark red. It would have been more like that. Uh, how did he find that color? You usually can't find naturals like that. He, he wasn't, um, I have no idea how he found most of his colors. All I know is that his suits looked great on him, but then he, he sold the suits, right? He sold a couple. Um, but his suits, uh, that he sold, uh, were of the most shoddy quality I've ever seen. Like, just bad stitching, or? Uh, bad stitching, it looked like he was using, like, a white Elmer's glue for most of the gluing. Um, it just didn't look... All the fur looked like it was being held on by the glue and not so much the stitching. Uh, they don't make fursuits. He doesn't make fursuits anymore. Um, and he was a bit of a, a recluse. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how else to put it other than then I, I wouldn't have bought from him. And that more so goes down to him calling me nothing more than a mere child when I was 19, which really arced me the wrong way. This guy was in his 60s. So. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just... Anybody who dismisses somebody out of age alone on something like fursuits probably should be making judgments because i've 
Yeah, just don't yuck anybody else's yum. It's more of a, if you want the fandom to do well, which we should, bring people in, encourage them, help them, tell them, hey, even if I wouldn't do it that way, I really like the ideas you hide behind it this way. Tell me why you did it that way. Explain to me what this is. Let's make this art form better together. Yeah, instead he was finding colorful fursuits and making fun of them for not being realistic enough. You know, that doesn't know. Like, you should encourage people to be realistic if you like being realistic, and then you should encourage people to be toony if you like toony. You should encourage everybody to do everything, because even if I don't like your style of suit personally, you're going to come back here in three years with a really cool technique for how to make moving jaws work, and it'll help everyone. Exactly. And he had some really interesting techniques that I did pick up on at the time, but the problem with most of his techniques were... So... We've talked a lot about costume design. He, for some reason, instead of talking about costume design, he was looking at things like they were wetsuits or functional pieces of, of equipment like firefighters' outfits or things. His suits ended up being very heavy, very weighted, not easy to put on or take off, not easy to wear. Like... I, I honestly... What his a fascinatingly bizarre concept. His, his idea behind a fursuit was less so cosplay and more so I'm going to go diving in a fur-padded suit, which was strange as shit to me. Yeah, like, I don't know orcas with that vibe. I know orcas. They don't do that. Yeah, uh, and he was doing wolves. And only wolves. He wouldn't touch anything else other than wolves. He also wouldn't take commissions from anybody under the age of 27. And he also wouldn't take commissions from anybody with a colorful fursuit. He would come back with a design that was their design, but more dull and less colorful. And that would drive away the customers. I don't... That makes sense. No, no, it's it's a commission. You make it to their specifications, not yours. And if there is any particular design thing, it's a, hey, I want to make sure I'm not sure if this will work in the physical medium the way you have it in your drawing. Maybe we should talk about that. Or does it work better like this? Or, but you don't like say no, it's a more of a just a raw suggestion thing. And if they say that, you, you go with it. You don't redesign somebody's character unless they specifically asked you to. Yeah, I've done several redesigns. So, me uh, me in, in the fandom, I am much more of a designer and a creative than I am a, um, specifically, like, a maker or something like that. Um, so, like, for me, there are actually plenty of existing fursuits that... Where they've got the head, they've got the hands, they maybe have a tail, but they don't even have a ref sheet. So I've actually been somebody who's had to design a ref sheet around a pre-existing design before. And it's one of the most fascinating things to do. I talked about it yesterday on uh, the VR stream, um, but Harry has a bat named Tiki. This bat is... he. Harry is super cool with, with Tiki. Tiki's a great Sona. Love it. But the tail got destroyed. The ear has was nicked when I saw it. The It didn't have a ref sheet. It didn't have a full body. All of the art pieces were from like the head up. The only thing he had left of the suit was the head and the hand paws. So I went through and found a couple we found a couple of motifs that we noticed within the patterns already we noticed diamonds behind the ears we noticed a red brown and gray color palette um and i took that and we we designed the rest of it theming it around cards and playing cards okay um and i, I just kind of ran with it so now he's got hearts on his chest he's got a nub tail version and a long tail version he has detachable wings He's got um, more, like, bat-style feet. 
He's got um, clubs on his tail, an ace on top of the tail, uh, no matter the design. So, like, if you looked at the tail from top down it, and just the silhouette, it'd be like, that's a club. Um, and if you saw the... If you saw the back of the ears, you'd say, oh, that's, that's the diamond of a card shape. Uh, he's got clubs on his uh, knee, uh, no, spades on his knees, and, um, yeah, essentially we just took the design and ran with it. All from just the head and the tail, because that's all he had. But I've seen people before, like, take a design that's already finished for a fursuit, and, like, they didn't even run with the ref sheet. So I, I guess the topic is, if you're making a design for a fursuit, and you've got it pretty much finished, and you've got just the head and the hands, you can design something else around all of that being pre-made. But don't change what's already there if you don't have to, if it's a good enough design. Like some oh, Absolutely. Uh, I know th this earlier this year, somebody had commissioned me to redo a ref sheet because the commissioner did the person who was doing it didn't do anything to specification. It was it was slightly the wrong color. It was the wrong. Um, it was slightly the wrong color. It was the wrong design. He didn't have certain patterns. Uh, the commissioner never checked in at all. But he didn't want to change it because it was a gift. A friend was... He, he had given him specifications to a friend, and a friend went and got it commissioned for him. And then the friend never heard from the commissioner until it was done. Yeah, that makes it a little bit harder, too, you know. So instead of being mean and, or going back or even attempting to talk to the person who drew it, which they did attempt, uh, the person also refused to make many changes uh he commissioned me to just do the design which i did in the matter of like i don't know a week mm -hmm. it's always interesting how like i've been like i think you're in a similar position to me where like somebody will give you a ref sheet and like maybe it's only got one particular angle to it or there's so many other things about it that aren't right and then you can just redo it and actually get it correct on top of the original artwork there which yeah. in of itself is such a good service and i'm I found myself doing that a couple times before I say yes to a fursuit, and I'm like, wait a minute, should I just start charging for MS Paint, you know? <laughs> redesigns at this point? Because this has happened, like, literally every suit. Also, just to check in on the chat real quick, um, we have something from Nudzu saying, I think it's time for men. I'm not sure which men it is time for, but that's okay. Yes, oh. I am men, it is time. Uh, we also have... oh. no, no, no. No? Okay, fair. Uh, hang on. I gotta... No. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, Kate, uh, hello, Case the Hyena. Hello, Versington the Kangaroo. Uh, yeah, no. Nozo, if you're gonna be a troll, don't be a troll. Wait. That is fair. Uh, but hello, Casey. Hello, Versington. Glad to see you in... If you could keep an eye on that, Argent. That would be... Keep an eye on him, absolutely. Uh, if you would go ahead and delete my message as well, that would be amazing. Uh, yeah, give me just a second to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and... Give you the mod status for the for today. Oh, dude, that's way too much power. Oh, God, now I'm just going to kind of fold myself into six pieces of over anxiety. Not really, but... Oh, yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be all right. Uh... No, we're discussing costume design and, and designing characters in general. Because these are ideas that go far beyond just anthropomorphic creatures. You know, designing a character, uh, you know, it goes for everything. I uh, One of the best pieces of information is I I've gotten is from someone who I wouldn't call a great designer, but he's got some good ideas. Um... So one of the, one of the best I, things I've ever heard was 
if you can tell that it is uh, that what the character is from a silhouette of the character and every one of them is distinct and clear from just the silhouette without any colors you've done a good job designing the character oh, absolutely um a good example of this is well team fortress 2 every pre-hats of course there's some question there but pre-hats every single team fortress 2 character is immediately recognizable from a silhouette and then they have a color palette for red blue team this makes it so easily in this split second you need during a shooter to be able to identify which character you're looking at which toolkit they're using and be able to deal with it it's an amazingly well done shooter for that reason i'm surprised at how many people keep asking me for a face reveal if you go back far enough in this channel you can find my face is it like a face scavenger hunt? I guess. <laughs> Alright. Should I do a face reveal one day and it's just me taking off a mask and it's another mask? Possibly, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. But like, that's a really like, it's, it's actually in the um, Valve developer commentary if you want to just boot up TF2 and play the, like, you know, Gaben talks to you about it for a minute. Um, and it's a really solid point of, okay, how are these characters designed? How did it work in the context of a shooter? A good amount of that design philosophy was brought over into Overwatch, but not as much as I personally would have liked. Yeah, um... A little bit too much glitter in Overwatch to be, keep things visually distinct, but, um, that is well designed around that, to be fair. My... another design philosophy that I've... I run with quite a lot is... Uh... When you make a colorful character, because my Sona is very colorful in the hair department, make it quick accents. Don't make it the whole design, or else you you risk losing the identity of the character. Uh, and what I mean by this is basically, don't shove a hundred colors in every part of your character. It's kind of the graphic design is my passion of, of of making a suit or making a character. Don't be, don't be a sparkle dog. Come one with the rainbow mush. Yeah. Um, if you've ever seen the full design of my main Sona, it is only the hair and the tail that are rainbow colored at all. Everything else is a pure white fur with uh and i wear very dull colors like i wear a dark jacket a dark uh, a dark red shirt a dark blue pants and that's that's to highlight everything else in the character not just that i have those those as actual attire uh and hello anubis fan welcome back and hello good to meet you So, those, those, that, that, that's the idea. If, if you can break down the color to just, if it's just color on a piece of paper, and it's in sort of the shape of the character, if it's just like, if I take the white, the rainbow, and the hair shape, if I can tell that that is my character, then you, then I've done a good job of designing it color palette wise and I don't have to add you know a hundred colors like presto has this in spades um, I think I could show oh, absolutely that. like I mean I'm looking at the stream right now there's a perfect example of it in the bottom corner where we can see his little nice uh, green pops green ear tips and the nice splotch over one eye from a line art standpoint it's nice and simple but it's immediately recognizable in the bottom corner yeah, you just get... This This is all you need right here, and you can instantly tell it's Presto. I add a little bit of a darker outline for the hair. Something for the nose. The little teeth. And then... The blue eyes. Done. You can tell it's a rabbit. 
and all I've done is highlight the colors, like bare minimum. These are philosophies that I don't see many artists actually talk about, which I think is a shame because I think more artists need to know when it when to slow down with a with a busy design. I mean, I think I get there's a big push in furry to have like the unique character design and since we're all working around a lot of commissions you don't have a lot of flexibility in that always which is why i think it's kind of fallen by the wayside but i think it's so important especially if you're getting a suit commission which is just if a suit maker tells you that they can simplify the stripes it's not a they don't like your character that's a they're gonna save you several thousand dollars and themselves several hundred hours of time like with 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 my main sony here I didn't want to take any concessions, and I didn't want to take the cheap way out with the, with the hair, because I know how my character's supposed to be, and I know that everything else on him is so simple that simplifying that hair or changing it in any way is just a disservice to my own character. But I but also, I would... but I also understand that it's a challenge. It's a massive undertaking and a big challenge for the way I I have it. Oh. Absolutely. Like, I'd honestly recommend, in the case of your particular Sona, to look a little bit more adjacent to the fandom in anime spheres for wig dyeing. Because that's going to be a really big part of the character. Um, but when it comes to your character, though, that's the thing, though. I don't consider your character to be overwhelmingly complex in design. You have the rainbow hair, but it's on that white background. I'm not sitting here for hours and hours and hours doing 10,000 snow leopard rosettes, for example. Yeah, and then the tail is super easy. It's all just flat colors, and you can do that with fur. Plus, with the with the hair being the way it is, it's the the way my hair actually sits is it's layered. Like, I think I think the best way to display it is kind of. like this okay actually i think i know what you're talking about like where the basically there'd be a layer of blue hair then a layer of green layered under that and then a layer of that yellow then the red on the bottom and so it kind of waves in between the few yeah so then you have this nice this nice curve look to it and it's not quite as difficult to make yeah, it's like one of those like you dot you you dye it using. I I'm really bad at this terminology because it's been years since I've done anything with my hair. But the uh, you fold over the bits of dye with the aluminum foil, and you could probably actually get that into a wig pretty damn easy, and then apply that to a head. Yeah. And again, it's um, a little bit frizzier, which is actually better for you. One of the primary problems that wigs have in fursuit is they get a little bit fried over time, but I think that would look more organic, especially in this particular case with this character. And uh, Doodle, you've seen my actual hair. You've seen me in person. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of know exactly the way that that would look on something like my actual hair. The way that exactly if you were to do if you were to do the layered hairstyle in in person that's how you'd want to translate it over again i wish i had more experience with wigs to be able to direct you further in this regard but again i know the anime fandoms very close to ours have a very good information on dyeing everything mm -hmm. uh well the nice thing is i've actually already got my suit commissioned it's being worked on right now it's also one of those things where i didn't trust myself to do it Maybe someday I'll give it a shot, but for now, I think it's fine. It's important to recognize, that, like, hey, maybe this isn't within my abilities right now. And honestly, it's like, a lot of art isn't just about doing it, but you also need to consume art to make good art. Like, I wouldn't know what the heck I'm doing if I hadn't been able to get my hands on a lot higher quality fursuits than I had ever seen before. And then I could actually see, oh, that's how you do the lining, that's how you do this. Yeah, I, uh, before making my suit, I had seen dozens and dozens and dozens of suits up close and per personal. And while I hadn't commissioned one other than Carmix before working on Presto, I kind of understood how they worked. 
I understood the basics, me basic mechanics of it before I even went in. Uh, even if I didn't know how to sew when I first started. So. Because the thing for me is I knew how to sew, but I didn't know next to anything else about anything beyond that. And being able to just sit down with people and talk about, okay, these are the structural elements. Some people do foam, some people do 3D printed. That was a very fascinating, like, busting out sideways from it. Fursuits are great because it's like if you put a whole bunch of gay dudes in a box and then locked the door for 30 years and then came back and they developed their own style of sewing. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also... We're glad to have you back, Anubis fan. Uh, and hello, Tristan. Hello, February. Make sure you guys are leaving likes as you're coming in here. Oh boy. I think hello, we. Everyone. Uh, I think we might end up going. Uh, do you mind going a bit longer than two hours? I am totally fine doing so. I might need to take a break here real quick to use the restroom and take care of a few other things, but should be back in about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious where the other guy is. I understand his fursuit literally just came in the mail, but we're still owed pictures on that. Um, I haven't gotten anything yet. I think he's still... I don't know. I think he, he either forgot or he's... Or, uh... Oxide's just having way too much fun goofing around. Oh, no. It's, I remember when I, like, finished my first suit, nothing got done for the next six days. It was amazing. It was glorious. That, I believe, is his second suit, actually. But still... I mean, even more so, then. Yeah. Exactly. 100%. Also, hello, Azul the Cheetah. Bonjour, as well. Bonjour. Um... It's good to see people coming back in. Anyway, I'm going to pop out for two seconds to use the restroom as well as get some fleece and glue so I can get the mouth started on this parasaur. And I will be right back. Awesome, awesome. All right. So it's just going to be me for a little bit, and I'm still hanging out. I might have to find some different music because, of course I would. Um, music is hard to get. Uh, <laughs> but... Um... Hope everybody's been enjoying the stream so far. Uh, hello, Dimitri. Welcome, welcome. I hope you guys got my message earlier about how much I actually love you guys coming on the stream. Don't ever worry about what anybody says who isn't a mod, so... You guys are great. Love having you. Love that you guys share the links, share the love with my stuff. Um, I'm doing that on the wrong layer. Alright, so we got some nice red. All I'm going to do for this is... Work within my limitations here. All right, then we'll go for yellow. I just skipped a color because orange is always a pain in the butt to grab. Luckily, it's really easy to do. I hope everybody in chat's having a good day so far. Hanging out and doing art's always a fun time for me. I know I can't always see the chat, but... This is going to be a great way to kind of show you guys exactly what I mean by... Designing by outline and silhouette with colors. So all I have to do now is if I take away the outline here, you can still tell it's got the long hair, it's got the top ears on the tuft here, it's very clearly fluffy, uh, and you know, with the colors in the background and the white in the center, you could very quickly tell that this character has, you know, is recognizable. It's very clearly me. And that... That is what I mean by designing by outline and colors within the limitations. Uh, hello, Siskel Uh Are there good news? There's great news right now. We're, we're hanging out, we're drawing, we're having fun, we're at 50 views, we're at 
like almost 20 likes, you know, it's all around a good time. And Tyler, uh, that is the good news. The good news is that we're we're hanging out, we're having fun. Uh, Doodle Owl will be back in just a sec. He had to go get some stuff done. And I personally should probably stop and go get a drink. I just don't want to yet, because why would I want to? I'm having too much fun here. <clears throat> I'm also having issues trying to find uh, music to play over top of the stream, because I usually do. Because I'm picky when it comes to the music that goes over top of things. There we go. Let me know if you guys can hear that. If not, I can turn it up. Ah, but that's how you design with, like, color palettes in mind. What I think is even cooler, though... is some of the tricks you can do with when it comes to like shading and darkening things. Uh, the music for this is Uh, from Mega Man Battle and Chase. One of my favorite little kart racers. Uh, remove layer. Nah, I'm gonna keep that. That's a good layer to work with. Work with, work around. Uh, you're still alright, Stas, uh... Oh, cool. I'm glad you're back, honestly. It's it's always upsetting when some of you guys have to go for a bit, but... You know, I'm glad you came back. I'm glad you're here. Honestly, I like having all you guys come into the chat. It makes my life so much easier to, to go when the chat's a little bit more uh, talkative than normal. Especially when, when there's on-topic discussion, too, because mostly, at most of the stream, we've been talking about fursuits and fursuit design and character design and stuff, and a little bit of video games here and there, but, you know, takes it takes a bit to... Wasn't expecting a couple people to come in here and, you know, be rude. Love this brush right here that I love the fact that it's got this nice um, physical art balance to it. Might use that for the next piece. I don't know how long, much longer we're going to go for, but I do know that I'm having too much fun. You know. Already, I have returned. Uh, welcome back. Glad, glad you're you're back right now. Oh, wonderful. I hope there wasn't too much of a crisis when I was gone. Oh, not really. Just, oh, peop wonder just people talking and hanging out. Wonderful, wonderful. Actually, there is a massive crisis. I am on fire. Uh, everything is drowning. Don't even know how that's possible. Uh, <laughs> I'm somehow on fire and drowning at the same time. I respect that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a challenge. That's one of the lifetime's hidden achievements. Uh, how did he die? Very strangely. I mean, I think there is that one confirmed guy who did die that way because he was just, like, literally, like, working in Iceland and he was on a boat and then there was a literally a brand new volcano next to him. That would make a lot of sense. So it was burning, drowning? We don't know. It was, it was exciting. It was unique and exciting. Uh, it was all... Shout out... Oh, shout out to what? Shout out to the population of Iceland, because, like, you can see picture of them just kind of waltzing up to this erupting volcano, lava spouts going anywhere, and they're just casually taking photos of the cameras. 
I think that's funnier than anything else, honestly. So good. Oh, shoot. Uh, have I gotten to show you this brush yet on the uh, on Krita here? I have not, actually. I'm actually really curious about this program, actually. Because I'm moving away from Windows, I'm going to have to be looking into a lot of new editing programs and like software and stuff. And I've heard this one was designed by furries for furries. Yeah, well, it's for everybody, but yeah. Um, this The program I use for those curious Krita, it is K-R-I-T-A. Uh, it's nice. It's got this really cool brush that is just a pencil on its side. And it's great because it makes me trick people. <laughs> uh, I've done artwork on this program where people think I did all of it physically and then scanned it into the computer. Okay, that's cool. No, I really like the like kind of style it has. Like you can turn it to a forty-five, right? Yeah, I can. Uh, there's, there's a little wheel down here. I can just neat. So, like, are you using a mouse right now or a stylus? I just don't. Qu I'm not quite as familiar with your program. I'm using a Huion tablet uh, with a pen, and it's okay. I've got a nice visual on everything. It's got pressure sensitivity. I paid two fifty for it. It's not bad. It works. <laughs> Gets again. I'm over here struggle bussing with a mouse and a keyboard. So this is luxurious frontiers unknown to me. Yeah. Um. Abs I totally understand that. Uh. Yeah. No. Uh, fucking pen with a uh, with a Huey on tablet and two fifty plus Critis free. You know. My computer is pretty good, so it allows me to run things fairly easily. And credit is fairly what lightweight. Even on my older laptop, I was able to get some pretty good work out of it. Even if it did me... like to crash, because Krita likes to eat a little bit of RAM, and Chrome does too. So then, oh, it crashes. But, you know. Yeah, fair. I'm, running... I'm not... Oh. Go for it. I mean, my rig is older, but not too terribly old, but it was a tiny-sized one. Like, the footprint of this is 8 inches by 18 inches. Hmm. By, I think, 12, so... Got 16 gigs of RAM in it, but Micro-ITX does have a lot of heat issues. So the question is, can it run it? Maybe! Ah. Yeah, no. Our, um... The... the I've, I'm, I've got 16 gigs of RAM. And that's pretty much all it needs to run everything that I'm I'm doing right now. So yeah, that's not too bad then. It's about where I'm at. I'm at so yeah, shouldn't shouldn't be too awfully too too awfully much of a a mess. And uh, briefly checking in on the chat, uh, Foxano says, "Look at the anime eyes on them cat." I definitely agree. And. Uh, and then Anubis fan says, Hi, Fox on Earth. Thought I wouldn't see you again. Glad you guys are signing each other. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was something that I like to do with my designs. Um, when people give me them and they let me do creative freedom. I will ask whoever is owning the Sona what their eye color is. I don't know if you've ever done that. I mean, I have, actually, but now that I've, I've just, I haven't more accurately, just because it's been pretty dang accurate on the ref sheets, but that's something I should really start doing, like, just to make sure that everything matches one-to-one. -one. Like, when I do, um, like, when, when I do designs and stuff, if they let me go free, I will ask them, hey, what's your eye color? And I will make that the same eye color as their Sona. Nice. Because I think it's... It plays up a little bit of a connection uh, between creation and creator. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. It's a very personal touch. It's it's kind of why um, my main Sona has the brown eyes, because I've got brown eyes. Uh... Um, currently checking in on the chat, Tyler says his eyes are blue, Christian is orange, and I'm also shouting out to join the orange eye crew. Um, and God also says, draw me. Uh, maybe. I might, I might just, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, February says green for his eyes. Ooh, very, very nice. 
We're just shouting out eye colors at this point. Um, yeah. I'm gonna save and pull up a new doc again for the umpteenth time. If you want to go ahead and start talking about something else, I gotta come back and come back and do get a drink real fast. So, doodle. Dang it, sorry. You ever have that moment where you switch your push to talk key and you switch to a different push to talk key, and then you're just rambling off into the void, and everybody's like, "Where is the talking?" <laughs> Uh, it's like my life hath the stream. Alright, fair enough. I'm currently just at the moment continuing to tape the massive crest on this damn Parasaur... Parasaurophilus? Parasaurolophus? Everything's too damn Greek for me. Oh! I also would like to hear the uh, don't, chat... I don't know, uh, Ar Argent Letter, don't delete God's messages. He's just chilling. Okay, fair enough. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being an overzealous moderator. I am still new. Thank you for dealing with me. Yeah, no, uh, God... Respect you, God. Yeah, God's cool. God subscribed last, uh, part when we did Sonic 06. I, I'm sorry. Terribly sorry for being an overzealous moderator. You're chill, God. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, We no. just had a tr troll earlier in the stream, so I'm a little bit, you know, trying to vibe. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's new. Just give him time. Thank you for dealing with me. You didn't put him in timeout, did you? I mean, if God wants to put me in timeout, I understand. Uh, no, no, no. Did you put God in timeout by accident? Uh, let me make sure I didn't. I don't think so. How do I un... Oh, no, no, he's good. He's just... <laughs> wait, wait, wait. No, no, because if I put God in timeout, something bad could terribly happen to me shortly thereafter. I don't mean to... Like, you didn't. Last you... time a dinosaur put God in timeout, we just went extinct. Let's not do this again. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, I'll let you deal with all that. I need to, uh... I mean, if he's, God says he's going to strike me with thunder, that's better than being stricken with an asteroid. Thank you for that, it was way better this time. <laughs> I'll take as many loud noises as you want to throw at me. Uh, don't tempt him. There, we've had cars drive past my house and it picks up a mic and everybody in chat's like, What the fuck was that? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, like, people will drive past in loud-ass motorcycles and it'll just pick up on mic. I forgot that I had a drink next to my desk, so I can actually continue. <laughs> well, I guess the question is, um, what is God's eye color? I guess it could just be smite. God's eye color, I feel, would be, like, constantly changing, like, this hue bar up here, where it's just, like... Every single color at the same time, simultaneously? Yeah, it's, like, hypersonic. This is the color world, yeah, yeah. It's like hypersonic, he's just like fucking crazy. <laughs> oh. Eye color is a secret, that's fair. New color, secret. Woo, I bet that one lobster can see it. Rob. Oh yeah, that ridiculously rainbow colored rock rock lobster. Yeah. It's like, I didn't realize they were that freaking colorful before you boiled them. I feel kind of bad about that now. Or is the rock lobster a different kind of lobster to the one you eat? I do not know. I am way too landlocked for sea creatures. I believe the rock lobster is the one that you don't eat. Gotcha. But there is one that can see like a hundred and just, like thousands more colors than a human eye can. Like, to the point where it's a little bit overwhelming that they could see so many more colors. Like, I know birds, for example, can see a thousand percent more than we can. Which is really weird. Yeah, this is like... I'm not sure if that's... This is like a, this is like a step above that. Damn, okay. It's like the entire electromagnetic spectrum right here for you. Pretty much, yeah. I haven't been able to find it in years, but a long time ago, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, there was a Tumblr called Bowie Brachia, which was pictures of incredibly colorful sea slugs and the most similar David Bowie outfit. <laughs> and the worst part is, is like literally every single David Bowie had some member, like random nudibranch sea slug that was just a perjillion colors next to it. Like, yep, protrusions match, everything's the same. That's fucking great. 
Which resulted in the worst problem of if anybody ever had a sea slug for Sona and they made a fursuit of it, it would just be David Bowie. I think that is not a problem. That's more hilarious. <laughs> it's just is it your David Bowie cosplayer sea slug fursuit. Yes. Uh, I know my uh, Karmic really loves David Bowie. Like, absolutely outfits, the way he talks, everything. To the point where I had to watch The Labyrinth like a month or two ago. And my only question was, what the hell was that? And Truman just lost it. Like... That was apparently just what he wanted out of it. Yeah, I mean, no, it's... I don't know how I feel about Labyrinth, because it's the single most 1980s thing I have ever seen, while simultaneously being the most timeless thing I have ever seen. Yeah, I, I got nothing for it. Uh, alrighty, so continuing a little update from the chat. Um... The, uh, January the Tiger says, Hi, Gavin. God says no one wants to be blessed, or never mind. And continuing with eye colors, January is Cyan, uh, Gary's is Teal, Cyan or Turquoise. Shout out Cyan crew. And, um, Zero apparently Fox Novo's eye color is red and blue. He, uh, I'd like to remind everybody to leave a like as they're coming in here today, and, uh, yeah. No! Nah. Bless them all. Bless them all, God. I don't, I don't really exactly know how many people want to be blessed, but just bless them all. Just, just do it. Uh, and hello, Zero the Red Panda. Also, I have no idea what I drew here, but, you know. Let me scroll up a little bit. I'm kind of curious about it. Maybe we can write him a backstory. Sure. I'm not much of a writer, actually. I've needed... I've had... I have, like, three or four scripts that I need to have edited and checked. I mean, I wouldn't call myself too much of a writer either, but I've played enough Dungeons & Dragons to be vaguely competent at throwing together a story. This dude kind of reminds me of, like, if we were doing some Super Sentai stuff, this is your Corrupted Power Ranger. He's the Corrupted Ranger? Yeah, like something wrong happened, his face, his helmet kind of melted, but now he's evil. Or, like, he's got that kind of fractured look to him now because he's edgier. I don't know. He's, he's, uh, he's the Quantum Ranger where he's just a dick to be a dick. Uh. Yeah. Yes. Oh, man. I unironically love Power Rangers. I, I still keep up with the comic books as the best I can and watch the show every now and again because why not? It's, I love them, their 90s stuff so much. There's just so much raw, good energy to it. Everybody's having a great time, and then now we're here, crap, we need to figure out how to translate this into English, Samurai Pizza Cat style. And it's so well done. Yeah, and and they actually wrote a fairly competent, like, background story for everything, like the universe, and it's, it's like, insane. Basically, imagine you're a team that was given X amount of footage of Super Sentai and absolutely no translation. You're like, okay, we're gonna make this work. Somebody cast Reader Repulsa. Deep respect for that. Fun fact, they did not have an English actress for her until, like, season... midway through season two. She was all dubbed. She was all dubbed until, like, midway through season two and nobody noticed because the actress looked so similar. Okay, that's funny. Well done. <laughs> 10 out of 10 for typecasting there. And it's still not in... It. That was the voice actress, too. Like, she did both. Okay, that's good. So, so she voice acted and dubbed over, and then she just started playing her role as soon as they got to that. Okay. Yes. Just yes. Yeah. I don't know. I know just... I have a deep respect for the witch character that emerges from a dumpster instead of a coffin. The, the, the vibes here are on point. I aspire to be a villain of this caliber. Yeah, I... I think the... Did you know she had a backstory? In uh, the comic books, they, they gave her a backstory finally. Really? I haven't heard that part, because last I heard it was like a not sure if witch or vampire emerging from dumpster. Uh, so she, she is a witch who emerges from a dumpster, and her father is, like, Lord Vile, the evil... the evil emperor. But... Her mother is the Empress of Good. 
Okay. From the middle of space, and Zordon was set to protect. Because back when Zordon wasn't in the giant cryo tube, uh, Zordon was set to protect her and the 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 new who was supposed to take up the mantle. Uh, who ended up being being Reed or Hulsa, and they failed hardcore. And it's like half the reason Zordon ended up in the cryo to like stuck out of time. Interesting. Okay. Um, but essentially, stop Master Vile from uh, taking taking Rita. That plan failed. Okay, now we're gonna have to stop Rita sometime in the future when that ever that happens. This is a deliciously Dragon Ball Z flavor to my um, Power Rangers that I didn't realize I needed. Oh, it gets it gets cooler because they've they've sent a bunch of the Rangers who had already gone through their season and whatnot into a uh, into space but outside of where the morphing grid can reach them so now okay. so they have a there was a whole team of rangers who were feed who were using their powers via one specific person who is the physical embodiment of the grid okay okay um, but every time they used it, it essentially it, like hurt her a ton, and her team basically all turned on her and died. So they had to, uh, so the Rangers in that sector are known for failure and being evil. So they kind of have to stay secret. It's it's really interesting. Eventually, you know, this is like some this is some bizarre combination of 40k and or Dragon Ball Z flavors added into my Power Rangers, and I didn't realize I wanted this. This is good. Oh yeah, uh, I don't know if you've seen the most recent season, but they have a little dinosaur character who is an engine yeah. who is an engineer, and she is my favorite character, like ever. Like if Damn that it, they write it. It's got a, the costume itself has a moving jaw, light up eyes, everything. It's great. Alrighty, just checking in on the uh, chat for a moment real quick is, okay, God says that everybody is blessed, except the guy I was going to strike with thunder. That's fair. I understand that I am not blessed. Respect that. He says he's going to go by. He has stuff to do. Thank you for joining us, God. I'm terribly yeah. sorry for being overzealous and hope to see you again. Yeah. Um, Anubis fan. Uh, says, thank you, God, if I've already been baptized once. And he's also talking about, like, how he graduated from middle school and then he goes to high school. Um, anything else? Anybody else having in? And, um, do you know the link? Says, says hello, Gavin. And he's talking hello. about how he actually has yellow eyes. Cool, cool. Uh, I don't think there's really anything else going on. Cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, boy, I don't even know... Where, where was I going with some of this? I don't know. I had we to... were talking about Power Rangers. We were talking about David Bowie looking like glorious sea slugs. Mm-hmm. Um... Which Labyrinth was just, okay, cool. Jim Henson, David Bowie. Why was this ever a crossover event? Why was this so wonderful? Fun fact about that movie, by the way. They, uh, the whole reason David Bowie is in the movie is because Jim Henson's kids wanted, uh, them to, they wanted to meet David Bowie and, uh, requested that Jim Henson make a movie with David Bowie. Respect. <laughs> and Jim Henson had no idea what in the hell his kids were talking about, met David Bowie, and went, okay, yeah, I get it now. I appreciate this. Yes, that's not the response I would have had, but I have much more respect for it than I would my own response. Yeah. Just okay, I get it now. David Bowie's awesome, but you yeah, know that was such a weird movie. Also, one of the first real big uses of CGI in the opening credits. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I think CGI is one of those interesting things. Like they, a lot of people work with CGI. But when you tell people that you, you make movies with CG, completely CGI, 
people bash on those effects so hard. And I think it's because people have forgotten that you can have a mixture of CGI and practical effects. I think it more has to do with, um... There's this vibe using CGI or an even auto-tune about people where it's not about having the talent and being able to make things quickly and more cheaply, and I don't think that's a good way to view it. I think we should view these more as what do these scenes allow us to do and all the cool stuff that it can be. Like, there was, I can't find it now, but a really interesting YouTube video essay I watched a while back that was talking about great CGI scenes in flawed movies, one of which being Spider-Man 2, like, oh, Spider-Man 3, where the scene where the Sandman kind of puts himself back together. That was a technical achievement for that time. They had to manmate like, 10,000 individual grains of sand, or rather, 100 million individual grains of sand. And it was really moving and touching. Honestly, I yeah. really, I liked that scene a lot. It's literally a man choosing to continue to move just after losing everything. He has to literally put himself back together so he can stand on his own two feet again and keep going. It's the definition of, like, an understandable and recognizable villain is kind of put through that scene, and so even though the rest of the movie was Michael bayed out, you could still really feel that there, and it's still talked about this many years later. Honestly, I feel like you could really feel that in all of the Sandman scenes. I mean, there was... Rami talked about taking an extra interest in that character in particular, and you can definitely feel it throughout the rest of the production, despite everything else that wasn't exactly perfect about it, and I have a deep level of respect for it. Did you ever watch uh, No Way Home? I haven't yet, but I've watched snippets. Go watch it. Go watch it. I need to. It's just in between everything else and work, and it's hard to. Yeah, it's fair. It's just... I have time in October. Perfect. Uh... <laughs> All the cons are done in October. I can go do anything else then. Woo! And then MFF. Actually, are you going to be at MFF as well? or MFF is one of my primary cons. Perfect. Almost certainly. Uh, they have really, really good um, artist alley support for Fursuit Makers too. so there's really no reason for me to not go. It's awesome. actually something I was really impressed with them as, like a... Like, one of my major issues with AC this year, and it's not AC's fault, is just a, hey, we had really limited space because of COVID protocols, so I actually had to tailor the ears to the suits that I brought shorter than I would normally to fit within the space requirements. Versus at MFF, they're like, okay, if you want to sign up for having suit space, you can actually have table space for a few suits. So that's going to be really good for me. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. So I I'm actually going to be there as well. I'll be shooting some videos and whatnot, so... And if hell you yeah, hell yeah. if you bring along your suit, we could probably find. I could probably come up with some short or something that we could we could work on. I mean, Karmic should be done by then, and then Beacon, this Parasaur, should be done by then, and we should have matching purple for. <laughs> we can scream at each other in the hallway. It'll be amazing. Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, and of course, I'll be bringing uh, slightly updated and worked on Presto. Uh, for those who don't know what this is up here, this was my design for a villain. Um, for, like, the cult leader. I like it. This was this has got some really solid, like, D&D &D character concept vibes going on thus far. Honestly, uh, at the time, I, I still don't really play D&D &D a whole lot, if at all, mostly because I can't find people. But I, uh, I look um, back at old art books for older video games, like Final Fantasy 1. Believe it or not, I look at the North American artwork for those games. Oh, just returning to the chat still real quick, um, Skyler's Fans and More says, have y'all seen Spontaneous? Um, I personally have not. Have you? No, I have not. <laughs> Dang it. Is it a good movie? Mm, probably. Fair enough. Hey, just let me know more about it in chat. Gee. But as you were saying with D&D... Uh, yeah, I, I don't really play D&D &D as much. I don't really look at their designs. But I'll look at stuff like the North American Final Fantasy 1 artwork um, for inspiration on things like that. Because, believe it or not, when it comes to those older games that had a very anime aesthetic in Japan, in the States, they really, like, tried to dial it back in the other direction. Which I find fascinating. Especially when you get to... Stuff such as, like, Dragon Quest and whatnot. Because instead of going with, like, this as an anime aesthetic, 
they went with something more like that. It, it, it's just something small like that where it's like they've gone with smaller eyes to, to showcase more of a different character. It could be the exact same design, but it'll look totally different and totally separate. But so you're talking about, like, in certain anime, they would, like, change the eye shape then? They change the eye shape, the color palette slightly. Like, if you look at artwork for Dragon Quest Three for the NES cartridge in America, you get this beautiful flowing cape. But in Japan, it just looks like more Dragon Ball, but fantasy. But for, for us over here in the States, they heavily leapt into European fantasy and how did it look back and like how would you interpret King Arthur to look which is a okay, so it's still anime but it's leaning more heavily into that like if you've seen the, the Ca Castlevania artwork it's still anime but it leans more towards this beautiful European inst inspired designs I think one of the great examples of this returning to a topic from previous is, well, Resident Evil and Silent Hill. These were both very specifically kind of anime-esque properties, but in both of their cases, this was Japanese studios marketing specifically towards an American audience. And so the stylistic, you can very much so see the anime aesthetic in the way that the character models are made, but it's, again, you're right, toned down in a very interesting aesthetic way. Yeah. It's like because they don't have to deal... Well, I mean, they're their own culture with their own tropes that they have to, you know, market within there that they wouldn't have to market within outside of there. Which now this makes me really interested in seeing if I can find marketing materials for, like, American games in other countries. Uh, Crash Bandicoot is actually a massive uh, design for this. Because really? over here in the States, you know, we have this very American cartoony look for Crash... Uh, in Japan, they boiled it down to the basic look of what Crash Bandicoot looks like, and they went with that. It's like a very simplified kind of caricature as opposed to our cartoony Crash? Yeah. Interesting. And, and they changed the cuts, the cutscenes in the games to reflect that. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, let me see if I can pull it up real fast. Uh, Crash 4... Uh, Crash 4 was actually the first time when they didn't do that. Uh... So... I'm just gonna pull these up. So over here in the States, I'm just gonna pull up the, the box art for Wrath of Cortex. Very recognizable. Pretty good PS2 game. Better than the actual Crash 4 that we got on modern systems, in my opinion. Fair. But it looks like this, right? Well, what what uh, what Japan ended up getting was this. Interesting. So it's a very, like, simplified design. It's got brighter colors in some areas. It's, it's just corporate crash. Very much so. It, it, it's One of these is Gendy Tarkovsky. One of these is corporate crash. Really interesting. Gendy Tarkovsky being, like, uh, the guy who did, like, Dexter's Lab and a lot of your, like, thick line Saturday morning cartoons from the mid-2000s. Yeah. That, 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 uh, you know, that, that, I know who he is, but I'm sure the chat does not. <laughs> no, I'm like, crane a minute, no, no, reminding, saying the actual names of people, don't just presume. Um, let me take a look here. Oh, boy. I am all over the place today in terms of my focus. Like, I want to keep drawing, I want to finish up at least something, but... I'm also all over the place. 
That's fair. Um, yeah. Um, what else should we talk about? Well, I mean, we haven't gotten to the topic at hand yet, which is totally fine, but... Right. Let's bring it back around to this since, you know, it's getting kind of late into the game. What is the two-part video that we are going to be going over? This being part one, basically an introduction to who you are and what you do. But what what, what are we going to be talking about next week, Doodle Owl? Alrighty, so basically, I am going to Denver. Um, I have many, many, many concerns about Denver as a convention. Um, there have been allegations of transphobia amongst Steph. There have been questions about various drama from Twitter from six months ago that hasn't been managed. There are questions about people pretending to be staff in chat that have absolutely nothing to do with the convention. There was also something to do with a Chick-fil-A wrapper and all sorts of other questions regarding safety and outbursts from the staff. Because Corgi Events isn't just Denver, but also a bunch of other cons. In the best possible case scenario, I'm going to go there, and there's going to be no actual issues. Um, but... Voices bigger than mine have said that they're worried about various behaviors amongst staff if they aren't green, resulting in possibly rainforest-esque issues. I hope to God that's not the case. I really hope it isn't, but we're going to fall into the water as we see what's going on with this convention. Um, I was just really disappointed last year because people spent 10 hours in line, and that was before there was all sorts of Twitter drama and people and all sorts of other things happening online. I want to, before I just start throwing shade at this convention, I want to make sure that I know what the heck I'm talking about, but there's been a lot of culture cover-ups, a lot of questions about people who shouldn't be involved in the convention being involved, and I'm uncomfortable. So he is going to the convention, he's going to pick up as much information as he can, as well as, you know, promote his business, which you guys should go check out. Link's in the description for Doodle Owl's stuff. Uh, but I am... Big. Oh, you first? Uh, but the, the, the main thing that we're going to be going over in those uh, videos, in the upcoming video, is going to be how to better strengthen the community out that way, and how to better handle and manage that and uh what 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 should be the plays going forward from the community members out that way because i don't live out that way doodle all lives out that way i'm just the outsider coming in from a from a side of the community that's much much stronger and much much wider exactly it's a question of what is going wrong with this convention what can we do better and how do we make because I frankly feel insulted by a lot of the staff members. I don't think that was their intention. I don't think, and I think that was just more due to the fact of somebody's just, no one was on hand to handle moderating a chat. And I think if we have better communication going forward and talking about these things and talk about problems with our conventions and how to make things better, we can actually have this be more than just a bash fest. Yeah. But first things first, um, I don't want to bitch about things before I know what's going wrong, you know? And maybe nothing happens, but I come back and show you the best and worst fursuits of Denver next on like in a, on Sunday, and there's nothing else to talk about, and that would be awesome. I don't think that'll be the case, though. And we are still going to talk about the community regardless, because I feel it's important. You know, if if we had to get to the point where somebody's reaching out to somebody on this side of the coast to be like, "Hey, uh, can you help spread awareness about this thing?" You know, then maybe there's something more going on there, even if it is quiet this time around. What if it's not quiet next time? Well, how's, how best to avoid that? Exactly. And, like, right now, my current concern is that there's a generalized den for chat, and then there was a separate chat made for specifically voicing concerns for the convention in. I have never seen that be set up on any convention, and that includes things like say, DEFCON, which is 38,000 people? Things even outside of furry. It's a matter of why do you need to have a separate containment chat for concerns? See, Inter Ohio, uh, which is my local convention, uh, has one group chat specifically for Anthro Ohio and one for the staff members. But both chats are open and available and 
Um, easy, both of them have the same like staff members in them, and you can voice your concerns in either. Which yeah. is which is fair because one is meant for staff members, right? But the other is meant for uh, is meant for you know the general people, the people who are attending the con, people who maybe have concerns, questions, comments. It's just what happens, what what goes on. There. Exactly, exactly. And I have not felt that that's been available. It seems to be there's one Denver chat where you can only talk about these particularly approved topics, and then this separate one which has no moderation at all. And we don't know... It, uh, do, I don't know anyways. Uh, what is the... Uh, are, are, like, the staff members in both, or are they specifically avoiding one? over the other. They appear to very much so, I mean, in both or avoiding both would be how I would describe my experience. Like, there was a good particular point of time, like, on Monday, where I was in debate with this one person who was defending the con for a while for a solid 45 minutes before they admitted that they had nothing to do with the convention. Why is this person in your chat debating and talking as a staff member for hours and nobody saying no you're not with the convention no we're not doing it that way this is this other thing it's like they're scared to address it like there's this don't even talk to me don't keep pushing it under the rug to shut up shut up shut up until after the con and i'm really not happy about it and it's not even shut up about the uh, until after the con i feel like it's let's push it off until next year let's push it off until next year let's push it off until next year uh, you know, which is not a good way to handle things. It's, there are concerns, and I get that you want to just get the con running now, and making sure it happens now is the major concern, but there have been people asking questions about the lack of moderation, and who is getting banned in the main chat for six months. This is not a now issue. If it had just been people stirring the pot just now, fine. But if the man you booted off the board, Treble, is still an issue and still making concerns and people are asking how separate is he really for six months, how much of it is a now issue and how much of it is just boiling over now? Yeah. It's There's a lot of can kicking here and like just hoping the problem itself will go away, which doesn't seem to be the case here. The other thing that might be the case is that this was Treble's apparatus legally for a long time, and now they're moving under a to AEIOU as a non-profit. There might have been a matter of how much were they legally allowed to boot him until very recently. This could change as of now because he's gone and they've been able to do stuff because he has been harassing random con-goers on Twitter, and now they can actually boot him 100% of the way. I don't like that ending. But that's where we are. Yeah. And to go along with that and that whole sentiment there, it, no, it doesn't feel good to kick anybody from any community. And with a community as large as we as they have it everywhere, you know, it, it can be kind of difficult to go and point at issues because there is going to be so many voices pinpointing it. Exactly. So, the point of our discussion is going to more so focus around how to strengthen the community, how best to go about it, and why hasn't it been happening yet, and what steps they've taken and our critiques to that. Because, exactly. Because it's not always the fact that, oh, maybe, maybe they're always can-kicking. No! I'm sure that... Somewhere in there, there is at least a little bit of an excuse, a uh, little bit of a way to push things down the line. But there's also going to be people, or no, there's going to be a little bit of a few people who are at least trying to strengthen that community, strengthen that center there, and, and see what's going on and fix the problems. But it, it, the all that we see might be just kicking the can. But that's what we're going to dig into over the next following week over the convention as well, so. And I mean, sometimes 
All you can do is kick the can because you don't have the ability to make a process go any faster. Yeah. The Gears of Law grind slowly. Maybe it's a crap. It's going to take us six months until after the convention until we can move over all of this stuff. You don't know. I don't know that. There's no way for me to know that. And there's no way for them to share that. We don't but know. I do think Let's... I do think a hey, we aren't allowed to talk to it right about it right now on Twitter would have been good enough or a hey, we've heard you. We're dealing with it. There's been a very the culture of silence is not helping them as much as I think it sh they wish it would. Yeah, and, you know, putting out one mes message can work, but it's got to be a good message and not just addressing one thing. It has to address all of it, which is why I think the video format for this is going to really benefit, uh, especially because we have an outsider and somebody, an, an outsider not to the fandom, but an outsider to that region, but also somebody who's in that region who can get local comments and concerns. Absolutely. And the other thing I want to frame it as, and in everything in my life going forward, is I do not have the answers. I just feel that I would. this is a discussion we need to have. We can suggest how best to... We, we have a couple suggestions, but we're not going to say we have a one-size-fits-all answer solution for this. Exactly. And it's just more of a, hey, so... Let's talk about how our communities are structured, how we want to structure them, and what works for structuring them. And what does it? And what do we want of our fandoms going forward? And if somebody says pyramid scheme one more time, that's not how you structure anything. But, 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 but I like ancient Egypt. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but, what, but the pharaohs are cool. I really like Anubis personas. Uh, uh anyways. Um, <laughs> no. Um, uh, essentially what... We're just going to be diving in how to better handle things going forward with with different communities. And I kind of... I'd like for the video to be a nice overview and leaning more into a positive. I don't want the video to just turn into people bashing other people. That solves nothing, and it's solved nothing for... It sounds like a long time, and I'm... Especially if if this convention is the way I think it is, it seems like the community members have been working on bashing people for long enough. So it's, I've seen and there are bashing. I think people are rightfully upset, and I think it's appropriate to expect express that upset. And I've expressed it myself. But we're not here. Where does the making it better happen? That is the next step. Yeah, uh, one thing that I heard in... I, I took a leadership class a long, long time ago. And one of the things they told me in that class was... A lot of people... Uh, it, a lot of people look for something strong in a leader. And people, you know, when a leader is doing nothing but bashing other people... It, it's a sign that they don't know what they're doing. That they're just flailing and hoping it works... Meanwhile, if they were to properly sit down, take a look at what they've got, they might come up with a totally different answer instead of flailing. Exactly. It's... Is it just going to be a bunch of raging and shrieking and having issues with it, or is it they're going to be some kind of looking at the problem and addressing it? Uh, so, you know... If you ever see somebody flailing and, and whatnot, just just know that they probably just have no idea what they're doing and they're being badgered constantly to solve a problem, which isn't what we want to do. We don't want to badger the staff members or the community leaders or anything. We just want to take a look at it and go, here's our opinions, here's our thoughts, here's what we probably would have done in this situation. Going forward, I think they should take this approach, but they could do any number of things. This is what I would have done, but there are a thousand solutions to X problem that could also work. 100%. This isn't school where there it's like, it's one, that we have one suspected answer and it's three. Uh, <laughs> like, there is no furry god that tells you that this should be the only way. Exactly. Except for God in chat, but that's, that's indifferent. That's something different entirely. Um, yeah. But that's... Way, I just want to point out how awesome the little tongue on this zombie on the Resident Evil thing is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I tried. <laughs> I tried for a liquor, but only from memory. <laughs> I mean, pretty good. <laughs> oh boy, I don't know what else to add for this. Also, we have somebody else new in uh, chat. A Revolta says hello there, Gavin. Hello, hello welcome, as well. welcome, welcome. I'm just hanging out with Doodle L today. We're talking about Denver and how best to handle situations. This is kind of the part one introductory to Denver and who Doodle Al is. It's less so a part one and more so a hey, if you you want background on what he is like, so that way then we can you know press on to the actual situation. Here's Bro, a... I'm legit, I swear. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I know that a lot of people are just like, oh, well, we're just gonna... They're... Uh, they're, they're gonna point at me and they're gonna go, well, who are you? Because you're so far away. And who's this other rando? Um, which is a concern. But the no, thing... No, I'm absolutely a rando. Please ask me all of the questions. Well, yeah, ask us all the questions, but at the same time, like, it doesn't discredit credit us any more than anybody else who's in the situation. Well, it's almost like the fandom isn't top-down celebrities talking to their audience, but us all streaming to each other and enjoying each other's work. Exactly. 100%. It's why I have so many different people who come on this channel. Like, I've had Sammy, Samson Kitty Fox, and he does his own content. I've done... Spectre, I've got a bunch of nobodies like uh, like Oxide and whatnot, who they're not nobody, but they're not you know, constantly putting stuff out on the internet. They're not doing constant content like me or Sammy or Spectre or anybody else, or somebody like Artie who does memes and isn't quite known for talking out a whole bunch except for on my channel. And like having somebody like Doodle Owl who does fursuits, not many fursuiters are going to come onto a stream and, like, show how they do fursuit stuff, because it's faster for them to just work on a fursuit than... I mean, the big issue is also, like, um, I can do a suit really... If I'm working aggressively quickly, that's a suit a month, and what that means... That's, that's not enough to be on any sort of streaming content. Exactly, and it's easier for me to get people in. They may seem like nobodies, but they're the people who are important to that area and important to the locals, even if it may not seem like it at the time. Exactly. Or it's on the other side, it's a matter of how about we help boost each other and find cool stuff and help each other do amazing things. Everybody has their own particular platforms. Like, I've already been showing off this really awesome icon art I got from Gavin today, and I'm going to particularly show it to a bunch of friends out here. And, like, as we're talking about ref sheets, I know a lot of people that need ref sheet I'm going to push in your direction. It's almost like everybody can help everybody here. It's not a top-down thing. Nobody really needs to be big or fancy. Um, yeah. I think that's, like, one of the bigger issues I've always had um, with, like... A lot of popufers and celebrities in the fandom, it, it's nothing to do wrong with them, it just doesn't... And I'm happy that they're doing well and having a fun time and all of their followers are having a good time. But it's not why I'm here. I, I'm here to be horizontal with all of these other cool people and talk about doing this cool stuff together. I don't need to pine for someone or something. Yeah, I, uh... Like, when I go to Furcons and I'm constantly talking about my YouTube channel... I try my best to be personable about it, even if I'm not very good at that, because I'm just a person. Honestly, when I first started doing YouTube, I was stressed and nervous, because... Of course I'd be stressed and nervous, I just had lost my job. Uh, well, quit my job, and had no income. Um, so, like, of course I wouldn't shut up about it. Nowadays, I know that it's better for me to just mention it casually, and people will show up. And the other thing about it is, is like, as you build confidence, the confidence builds with you. Again, I still don't think I'm the best at making suits, but everybody keeps telling me, and it keeps working out, so I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, and of course you'll probably make a mistake someday, but for now, ride it. I make mistakes every day. 
Exactly. I make mistakes every day. In fact, I make a lot of mistakes every day, but... <laughs> Uh, such as me not working on the thumbnail for this video until, like, an hour before the video. <sighs> ah. But, yeah. Back to the topic of community members and leaders. Like, we know they make mistakes, but... We also know that... It's it's better to reach that with po uh, reach out positivity than it is to just tear them straight down. It's they're trying their best ninety nine percent of the time, and when things go sideways, it's usually a matter of just not realizing you needed to be forceful enough. Or, oh god, I didn't realize my friend had gone that far. Or darn it, I thought that was better handled than I did, and I didn't realize it was that big of an issue. It's pretty easy to handle. It's uh, just, like, we have to remember to not overwhelmingly crap on people, I guess? I don't like slinging insults. I understand I can get heated, and that's a big thing that can happen with people sometimes. But focusing on the concerns at hand, not broader ones, and being like, hey, this is the problem, is the better way to address it. Yeah. Uh, Skyler's fans and more, please stop freaking out in chat. I can see your, your messages. I can read them. But the the stream is not about you. It is about something larger, something more important. It's about a community that is slowly fracturing itself midway through the fucking continent. And about how me and Doodle Hell are going to hopefully try and point them in the right direction. Isn't that right, Doodle? Again, I don't like shutting people down in chat, but that's the point. This isn't about me. This isn't about anything else. I mean... Yeah. And I wouldn't say we're slowly fracturing throughout the middle of the continent so much as it is... The community has been fractured post-COVID. How do we put it back together? How, how do we make this work best for everyone? 100% agree. Just didn't really know how to put it like that, but yeah. It's it's everybody used to have a really solid meat apparatus for a while and through a combination of not having the proper boundaries to keep drama from affecting meat's quality and again just literally nobody could fucking do anything because there was this, my apologies on swearing darn it, um, but nobody could do anything because there was this massive pandemic and anybody who could socialize really shouldn't have been and that was not resulting in the best of people result going to events kind of did fracture things down the middle a bit and everything kind of elevated to this online space that i'm as not as used to and i'm still getting used to and interacting with now and i'm happy that gavin's helping me get on here yeah 100 percent. so don't be getting huffy and ticked off that i'm not reading every single comment today you know as this community builds and grows you know it happens and, and, at, and as I pointed out last episode, to me, most people in chat are strangers, including you, Skylar's fans and more. It, there's, there's an audience level of... I don't remember what the term was. There was a, uh, there was some, there was a video that I watched years and years ago that had to do with the relationship between a viewer of a piece of media and the content creator and how on YouTube it's less like you're playing a character and more of yourself so some people get attached to that self even if they don't realize that they have no idea who you are what you do or why you do it so it's kind of like a weird parasocial relationship so I'm not going to always pay attention to your comments I'm not always going to see them, and I'm not always going to understand them or care for them. So if you're getting upset and angry in chat, recognize one thing. I am a stranger 100% of the time. And that is not to be mean, that is not to be rude, that is just the way the internet is. 
we can have all sorts of cool conversations from all sorts of people. But again, I am also on some degree a stranger to Gavin, even though I am on the stream itself. And I, part of part and of this is. Get... And, oh, sorry. Please go ahead. We may have met in person, and we may ha I may have commissioned him, and he's on the stream. But he's still a stranger to me for the most part. Like we share a lot of really cool interests, and that's kind of why I have him on here. And yeah. Again, going forward, I hope to be less of one, but that's something that has to be built with time. It's not something I would ever presume from being on stream. Mm-hmm. 100%. And Skylar, you showed up, I believe, a couple videos ago. I'm not like instantly, oh, you're my best friend now. It takes time. It takes time and takes maturity. And I think that's the maturity that you as a viewer don't fully have and it, it took time for me too like i used to I, I don't know about you doodle but i used to watch a lot of youtubers growing up and i used to look at them and um imagine what it would be like to be their friend and eventually it's so part of me got in that mindset of like oh everybody i meet on the internet's a friend which isn't true it's it's just not it's not a healthy mindset to be in it's kind of like looking at all the celebrities and going, ah, they must know best because they're they're big and they know stuff and they're on TV constantly. That's not true either. I mean, I used to do this with people I met in fandom and it became incredibly damaging for me because there are a lot of folks in fandom who are chill to hang out with for maybe a weekend or two, but are not the kinds of people who are going to be okay to include that intimately in your personal life. And I've had to move out of places simply because I had roommates that were not able to understand that boundary, and that made me very sad. But that didn't mean that those experiences were any less fun or amazing or interconnected or cool. It's just understanding the boundaries that allowed them to happen were the ones that allowed them to happen. Yeah. And if we try to get all up in each other's personal lives 100% of the time on the internet, well, um then there's not going to be any amount of boundary to allow people to be on the internet. I think that's kind of the big error of safety of social media in of itself. Oh my god, I love that. It, this is a great example of what you were talking about and the character being recognizable from a thumbnail and just a few lashes lines. E. 100%. God, I, you captured my internal anger so well. God. <laughs> With the flailing, I'm like, yes, just yes. <laughs> you can't, the chicken energy is real. <laughs> so, yeah, when it, when it comes to the internet, it can be kind of a parasocial place. So if you're young on the internet, recognize that the, these people that you are meeting are not always going to be the best people. And sometimes you have to take the harsh decision of, hey, take a step back. I'm not, I don't know this person in real life. I don't know this person personally. Therefore, I should stop and take a breather and recognize that, hey, everyone's human. So. Mm -hmm. That and if someone is willing to be your friend instantly, it might be a good idea to ask what they want from you. Yeah. Also, can we? I love this 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 particular vibe of the very calm wolf, and I'm just flailing. This is this is my life. Why? Why have you figured it out so perfectly? <laughs> I feel so seen and called out simultaneously. Me. <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on. I gotta like, I'm gonna draw a little bust, a head bust. <laughs> bust, perfect. Uh, hang on, we'll just. <laughs> this is, this is, it's perfect. It is absolutely perfect. Gonna need to like erase a little bit of these lines. Um, 
suits. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Especially with like the wingies that just flail kind of in 16 different directions like the noodle arms from Adventure Time. Oh yeah. So, so good. They're great to draw. What's what's great about this is all of the all of these works are going to be up on Twitter afterwards as well as my Telegram art group that's in the description below. So if you want to see any of these in higher detail, go for it. Wonderful. But no, um, that's something else that has contributed slightly to the fracturing of of the community, though, is those people thinking that everybody's their friend, and then when they find out they're not, they lash out, and because they don't know how to handle it, they basically go at everybody, which can cause problems later on down the line. Had one too many problems with this in my damn living room yeah like it's a it, you weren't dating the guy you were never dating the guy there's and that's okay but there's a level of wailing and having a breakup that never needed to happen in my living room and that's okay but not in my living room yeah um when it comes to like having friends in this fandom I'm willing to be friends with anybody, but they also have to recognize that I'm a fucking person, and I'm not always going to be able to talk to them 24-7 or see them 24-7. I'm not going to always check on their comments all the time. This I, is I, uh, whenever I talk to anybody online, um, with the exception of I commission you, that's a bit of an obligation that I will be messaging you about the commission. Otherwise, I might fall off the pace of the earth for, like, months at a time. That doesn't mean I care less. Actually, there are people who I might not talk to between whole years of conventions. It's just because I have other things going on in my life. They have their own lives, and they go on across the country. It's not a mean thing, and we just hit it off like we always have when we get back together. Mm -hmm. Boundaries are not the means by which I tell you no. It's the means by which I provide myself the ability to say yes. To, to better illustrate this, one of my favorite songs is by Rush. It is um, about how being in the limelight, its song is literally called Limelight, uh, how being in the limelight and the spotlight can be very difficult for oneself because they have to put up a bunch of boundaries, and if you don't put up boundaries, you can end up you know, angrily, you know, lashing out at people. It's, I mean, especially if you're online or have a public-facing persona, it's, especially the context of that song is, you have to put on the mask, otherwise you'll lose most of you to the concept of the performance. Yeah, so, I am the cat, right? I am me. I do play just myself on this channel. But I want most of you guys to understand that me being like this and more, like, mellow is part of the act. Part of the acts I put on YouTube, because I am chaotic. I am crazy at times when it comes to the way I act. Sometimes I can be a little erratic. Somet sometimes I'll say stuff in person that I don't wouldn't say on a YouTube channel mostly because of guidelines, but also because why not? Uh, there, there's always going to be some jokes that are left on the cutting room floor that I think are funny. But overall, like, if you see me on a video and you say, ah, I want to be friends with him, recognize that part of this is just a character. I do put my full face out there. I do put, m put my character out there. I put my heart and my soul and my effort into this. But it's also partially an act. You know, I am actually friends with Artie. I am actually friends with Doodle Owl. I am actually friends with pretty much everybody who comes on this channel. But they all know that it's partially an act for this channel. If that makes Exa sense. You know, it's, it's not me being in... Like, it's, it's not me being like... 
dishonest or distrustworthy, it's me putting up that slight mask to be like, it's me, but it's not quite. The way I heard this put once a long, long time ago um, was called prismatic identity. It's think of yourself not as wearing masks, but having different faces, the same way a gemstone has different faces, and the light will catch it differently from different angles. It's not that any of those faces are false, it's just depending on which angle you view it from, you will be seeing a different one. Exactly. Which is how, how, how I'll be. Like, if you catch me on a video, I am the Rainbow Cat, I am nice, I am calm, I'll try to be relaxing, I'll be silly and goofy when I can, but overall, I'll try my best to be entertaining. You catch me, you know, high as shit on, in my living room, you will see me act more of, more like Presto. I will be horny, I will be crass, I will be a little bit rude, but I will overall be mellow and chill. You see me at the fucking grocery store and say hi, I'm going to wonder who the hell you are until I figure it out. Uh... <laughs> You know, there's just, you, different, you see different sides from different things. Like, the really shock, it's really funny when I meet people in person and they realize that I don't wear nice clothes ever. So like, I swear to God, I'm not catfishing people, but yes, I am the person in the corner that's like the extremely well laundered homeless person. It's fine. Yes, the shirt, pants and torn, the shirts are torn, which is interesting because a lot of people meet me in convention spaces where I'm very dressed up trying to be professional and being conducting myself very differently, so they can physically recognize me and not recognize me. Yeah. It's, it's a different sort of face. Exactly. It's not false at all, just because there's nothing at all false about Doodle Owl as a business. No, that's me being more genuine than I have ever been in my ability to work and do cool things for myself and my community. It's just a different side of it. And part of making that happen for everybody is, you know, keeping that good professional face on it. It's it's why when you if you if you, that's why I still say Doodle Owl is partially a stranger to me because I've met them online. I've met them. Uh, at a convention. I can say they're my friend, but I don't know them that well. I don't... I'd love to invite you out to Colorado here one day soon, and we could go further than that, but again, that's not now. Yeah, no, no. If I was just like, hey man, I'm in the local area, you would lock your damn door and tell me to fuck off. Like, let's be real. I mean, not now, because we've had this actual conversation, but beforehand I'd be like, yeah. Stop it, stop, it. meet me at the McDonald's like five blocks down and we'll have chicken nuggets. <laughs> There's like, I know these really great, very public puka bars and coffee shops. Let's go hide it. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there you go. Like, send me, send, send me at least away from somebody's living space. And the only people who I invite to my house are people I trust, so. Which, weirdly enough, if we're going to continue to go talking glorious loops of conversation... I think that's the big problem I've been having with resetting up the meat apparatus out here, separate from a con apparatus. But no one wants to host in their living room anymore for very obvious reasons. Aside from COVID, just crazy people. I mean, the best way I've ever heard it put is bitches be crazy is a universal truth. Yeah. So, the best way to approach that um, is, like, what... Can we rent a house from people? Are there places out here in venues that would be willing to host us? Is anybody willing to host us? What else could we do? How do we do bi-weekly stuff? What are there bars? bowling alleys? Are there kid-friendly spots where we can actually have family get-togethers with everybody? Is Alternatively, having making sure to ensure that the not-kid-friendly spaces don't have any chance of things overlapping. Exactly. Like, you wouldn't want a fur meat at a Chuck E. Cheese. You know, that wouldn't work. But, you know, a bowling alley or a local arcade that's in a safe neighborhood, maybe. That'd be a great spot to, to fursuit and also have kids around. Meanwhile, if you had, like, oh, it's, it's, they're having, like, a half price drinks thing. I'm going to take some of my friends. Fursuits aren't allowed, but if you're furry, you're welcome. 
Meanwhile, during the day, middle of the day, it's a bar. Kids still aren't allowed in. Maybe fursuits are allowed. You just have to ask and see. Maybe that would work better for a meet. Maybe out in the park would be better. You just kind of got to look around and check. We have a lot of big cabins up in the mountains. So if there wanted to be a little bit more of a party meet, that would be a better way to not avoid disturbing neighbors. Things like that. 100%. And this is... And, and this all kind of stems back around to that topic that we had at, at hand about personal space and putting up masks and whatnot. If, if you see somebody like a streamer as a friend, understand that they're putting on masks and that they're not going to just invite you to your home. Like, um, they asked yesterday, Hi, Dizzy! Uh, Dizzy said, when I goes to cons, I just dress like a slut and go to all the dances. That's fair, but I doubt that you're like that outside of the convention spaces, Dizzy. <laughs> also, glad to have you on, by the way, bud. Uh, but, you know, if... <laughs> That's great. Uh, sorry. Now I'm thinking about that. Anyways. <laughs> damn it. Um, yeah, but when it comes to, like... Thinking a streamer is your friend. If if your streamer is your friend, unless you know them 100% in person, grew up with them, hung out with them, like that would be something else entirely. The way I think about it is, is like, if I'm interacting with a streamer on stream, I'm interacting with them in their job. I know people who do stream, but I've had them be friends for so long that I hadn't checked into one of their streams until years after they'd been doing them, and that was just their job the same way. Me working at the kitchen I was working at was my job at the time, if that makes sense. If you're interacting with them through a stream, you are interacting with someone at work. 100%. Like, right now, Doodle I was interacting with me on stream. Yes, he's part of the stream, but he's still at work. I, I am at work, I'm doing my job. In fact, I'm doing two jobs at once by commentating and drawing over top of it. Um, <laughs> that and I'm over here uh, just applying gratuitous amounts of masking tape to this fursuit head. And on push to talk so you don't hear the <laughs> of the tape the entire time. And that's, and that's kind of what we mean by well, like I'm interacting with him while he's doing his work. Like, it's just you, you'll end you'll end up with different sorts of things. You'll see different sides of people when you meet them in different places in different ways, which is why, you know, yeah, absolutely. I think like this goes back to an idea a friend of mine had years and years and years back, which is, hey, what do you want to do a panel? What kind of panel? Well. Let's dress up as the anti-pope and an anti-nun and talk about boundaries like religion. Damn. Interesting. Yeah, you know, the joke being like you knock on everybody's con door and say, Hello, would you like to hear about our Lord and Savior boundaries? And then just literally have a copy of that boundaries book you hand to people. Gotcha. It's yeah. both very funny and in like good and inform like funny and like informative not some I'm not sure not not something i would go for personally it, just because i could see it going horribly but still <laughs> oh, absolutely oh dizzy koala says whose persona is that the uh, dinosaur uh, i believe that be me he, that is that is doodle l uh he is a fursuit maker who we are graciously talking about today. He's going to be at Denver over the weekend, and we're going to be d discussing Denver and how to strengthen the community out that way uh, sometime next week. So, yeah. Yeah, I will be running around with a camera for a while. Um, best case scenario, it's a really cool con with a bunch of suits. Worst case scenario, we have a really awesome video about how we can do better. Yeah. Uh, and then we also, you know, I think he'll also be here for Among Us on Friday, probably, but, you know. Oh, that's the plan. This is the plan. The plan. Everything must... learn exactly how bad I am at lying, and this is going to be awesome. Perfect. Um, also, uh, people in chat are available to join in Among Us. Oh, that's going to be so cool. So, they're not going to be in voice chat, but they can text chat, so... 
Yeah. Um, what else can we say? Yeah, we've been talking for a while. I think we're actually already going over a little bit. Uh, we're at three and a half hours already, so. Damn, time flies. Uh, Dizzy, the chat is dead for a couple of reasons, but it's still a li it's still lively. It's just the people who come to chat are a bit. How would you put it? Um, would... To put it frankly, this is um, it's a Wednesday afternoon in the dog days of summer. There's been a few very bored children that don't quite understand the stream isn't about them. Yes. It's, again, on Sunday, on Friday, when, like, you know, actually people have time, and those of us who, you know, this isn't the middle of our work days, can actually prug and I don't think we'll have similar issues. Or, well, we shouldn't, but, you know. You know, this is a similar problem I used to have back when I played WoW and would try to organize middle-of-the-day raids. You couldn't get anything done even 20 levels below you because it was difficult to find an adult. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Speaking of which, I am excited to see exactly um, the continuing, ongoing, how do I put this? The ongoing clusterfuck of how um, Blizzard is handling WoW Classic. Because they're hitting Wrath of the Lich King, which is when they have the, uh, the queue begin to pop in. And that will be really interesting to see how that affects all of their uh, stuff going forward. Because a lot of people think that adding the Q2 WoW was one of the primary mistakes in its design. Now, here's something. What if they take it in a different direction? You mean if they managed to pull a RuneScape Classic with it? Yeah, that would actually be what they needed to do. Like, But, but I mean, make a new expansion that uh, does something, pulls it in a completely opposite direction that they went with original. That could be, I could, if done well, that can work really, really well, because that's what RuneScape Classic did. They kept adding content back to their 2007 kind of base version of the game, and that has been extremely successful. Um, and, but they had a little bit more of a concept of horizontal development, not just adding stuff at the end of the game where you have a new expansion at max level, but stuff like, okay, we're adding new skills in at every tier of play. But then RuneScape's a weird, weird game, so... Oh, yeah. It's a point-and-click adventure game from the 90s that's also an MMO. What? I think this is my favorite piece of today, honest to God. Just me screaming into the vault. It's so good. Just I all of it. Best. Just just everything on here. I, I just like how it all turned out. It's a good collage. Mm-hmm. We got, like... Brand new, the, the villain is Sentai, on top of possibly what he looks like without his helmet over there. Really good version of Presto down here with great design thing, the ears. The bottom that suits me screening into the void, which is just a perfect encapsulation there. Resident Evil tongue man going blah, 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 and the dude above it. And then just... You know, like, I see three different things. This is, like, better than a lot of the concept art I've seen people show up to D&D games with for their characters. <laughs> I love it. These are just the little doodles that I do when I get bored. Honestly. <laughs> hell yeah, hell yeah. Um, yeah. We've done so much art today, though. It's it's just all been really nice doodles. And I think that's... I think that's really... While we've talked about a lot of important stuff and a lot of really neat stuff, I also feel that... The art side of the art stream today really helped focus everything. Oh, absolutely. It's, I mean, that's... It's easier to talk over me drawing about anything than it is a video game. Yes. It's actually a really solid idea, just like a stream format is the talking streams are drawing streams and then having fun video game commentary ones the other ones. Which is what I try my best to do, and I, I think a lot of people have started to actually understand that, which I think is great, but I'm not to the point where these... I'm not to the point yet where these streams do super great. Um, which is okay, but I mean, I'd say that we did fairly well. Today, today so far, we're at almost 80, 80 viewers and almost 20 likes, which I think is really good for an art stream. In fact, I'm really glad you guys have been enjoying this overall. Honestly, for a Wednesday afternoon art stream and the fact that I have literally never been on the internet before today, this is amazing. 
thank you all for showing up. Yeah, and I'm sure that we'll get to do this again sometime. I try to make Wednesday uh, the middle point of the week where it's just kind of chill out, relax, calm down. Because, yeah. Honestly, if, if you would like to have me again, I'd like to continue to pop on. 100%. You're always welcome, and I'd love to have you on for art streams because we keep running into very interesting points of conversation that I don't normally have. Yes, I love this. Uh, it's kind of the reason why I like Oxide so much, because I've run into some very interesting conversation pieces that I don't normally have. Like, I would have loved to talk about the conspiracy theory stuff from the beginning of the episode a lot more, but just because today is a bit more of a serious topic and in-depth on that, I I kind of wanted to steer clear of the, the fun stuff before. Totally fair, and then we can actually make it, like, we'll have a really good fun one where we write a terrible campaign setting based on this. It'd be hilarious. Just like, okay, how do we make a really bad conspiracy theory D&D setting go? 100%, and we could we could do that next Wednesday when we're a little less, uh, yeah, because by that point, we I think me and you will have that video idea for Denver pretty much solidified by that point, and... We'll know what we're working with, and then we can do all sorts of cool stuff from there. Yeah, and we we could push we could do that the following weekend, and then we'll have something fun for the middle of the week. So that way, then we can you know relax. Marvelous, <laughs> marvelous. Yeah. And wait, see you on Friday. Uh, yeah, we're not quite done yet. Um, I've got to. Sorry, I'm not. I have to close out the video still. So, for those new to the channel, be sure to subscribe. Once the video is done processing, there will be two. Uh, there'll be a video on a playlist on the screen that you can click on and check out more content. Uh, we've also got a Twitter at GavinDragonYT. Make sure to go check out Doodle Owl's stuff. All uh, links in the description. We've got a Discord, a PayPal if you wish to donate, and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, I'm sure tomorrow will be more fun. We're doing new Super Mario Brothers Wii. Uh, I've been your humble host, Gavin the Kitty. Good night, everybody. Bye.